Okay, let's get going here. Okay. Shall we? We good? Okay, so I got a couple slides here around the role of people, but I don't think we need to really talk about these too much because you've got lots of stuff around your role. Um, one thing I just wanted to touch on here was around this, this whole accountability issue, because I think this is where, this is part of how, um, as counselors, you have, and uh, you know, I do have some slides here that's where I try and articulate this, that you have sort of group responsibilities, corporate responsibilities, as part of this council decision making, etc. but you also have some individual kind of activities and responsibilities and things that you do and so I think that as a group the council has this um, accountability to the community and the way I think of it is by you do it your accountability is exercised by listening that's why you have your public engagement processes and that's how individually you play a role in this listening business and then also the reporting and so understanding as a council, perhaps, um, you have different processes in place in your policies around community engagement and how that is technically done and carried out and when it's required and all of that kind of thing. But I think it would also be interesting, um, and maybe we should just put that on our list as well, it's just around, you know, and kind of your approach to that. Because I think um, this is also, Part of understanding your relationship with the community as individual counselors, I think is important. And how does that fit into your responsibilities? And I think that it's part of the listening and reporting. And what role do you play as counsel and what play, role do you play individually? So this is just a bit of conceptualization because one of the things that you'll notice, of course, is the council is all very high level, big picture. So it's not Mrs. Brown's or the green painting street, <coughs> maybe that is a policy, but mm. externally, so it's really the long-term strategy, which I know you talk about, and accountability to, to people. So the openness and the transparency of your decisions, the regular reporting, obviously the ultimate accountability is when people get to decide whether you, they think you've done a good job or not. Um, and then internally, the council you know, people sometimes ask me, what is policy? What is policy? I don't really get policy. And for me, it's really um, around setting the framework for how the city behaves. So what are the standards? What are the, what's the service levels? Um, you know, what level of community satisfaction should we have with how <coughs> the front desk at City Hall and when I come and have a complaint and it's resolved and how, you know, what are the days in which it must be responded to and dealt with and what have you. And then you've got these internal responsibilities which are, are some of these organizational things that we talked about around the city manager, succession planning, risk management, uh, fina you know, financial plans and things like that. So I think of it a bit around the external and the internal, just put that in those boxes. Yeah? This is a ridiculous question, but would you say that our role is to be more concerned in on balance with the future than with the present? Yes. Yes, I think that as council, um, that should always be your primary focus around, because you are where you are, mm -hmm. and what's past is past, so it can be mostly around the future. Yeah. Great, thank you. So here is where, um, you know, we obviously, as a member of the governing body, you're participating in the council's responsibility and then as an elected person, because as I talk to people and as we talk about the difference between corporate governance on a body, on a corporate entity, and an elected position, there's a reality there that you're elected by people. People phone you every day, or bump into you in the supermarket, whatever it is. They have expectations. We need to educate them better about what they should expect from you, I think. Um, but you do have this representation of residents and ratepayers, taxpayers, whatever we call And the point here that we've made before is it's everybody once you get here. You're providing leadership and guidance and facilitating some communication because you, you are part of it, um, you know, and a number of you 
you get calls from people, you uh, set up opportunities for people to talk to you, that's okay, but we should talk about what's appropriate um, way to handle that in, so that you are always protecting the interests of the city. And so I'd like to pause here and say that when we talk about the behavior of an individual councillor, um, while it is about an individual, the most important thing is we, you, have to protect the integrity of the city. Because if the integrity of the city is compromised, you will have trouble dealing with uh, people who want to come and do business and set up their businesses here. I know you have a push around economic development. You will have difficulty uh, relating to other levels of government with whom you might want to have some financial agreements or social agreements on social policy or whatever it is. Um, and people within the community, if they don't respect the city, stop paying attention to it. And so there's a lot of reasons why we want to protect the integrity. And I often talk about this in the areas of conflict of interest. It's not about whether I'm a good person or a bad person because I, I might have a conflict. The reason I have to be hyper vigilant around conflicts is because if I'm involved in a decision where I have a conflict, it's not about me, it's about I compromise the integrity of the decision making because somebody from the outside who doesn't see the inner workings will look and say, well, of course they made that decision because so and so was in the room and so and so has this particular interest or is associated or married to or goes out with or is a good friend of or is part of that company, whatever, who has or could derive some benefit from that decision. And this is why in public sector entities, in corporations, people are very, my words, hyper vigilant around conflicts. It's to protect the city and it's to protect the people's perception of how decisions are made. So um, I think that's a really important part. The role of the mayor. Um, well, just, yeah. well, it's also to ensure that decisions are made by those interests. Oh. So it's obviously beyond just the It's beyond that, yes, absolutely. It's to ensure that, the, yeah, that, I mean, that's sort of number one. But, but the secondary reason, which is as important, is to protect the integrity of the city. Um, or, yeah, Marianne. requiring you to have an ongoing outreach capacity with your residents and that is to not just look at the future and the big picture and the large strategies but to resolve the problems of Mrs. Brown's fence yeah. mm -hmm. and whether that's my doing something about Mrs. Brown's fence or just finding out how Mrs. Brown negotiates the city structures to get it resolved herself whichever works better it's still a much more personal and much more directive type of interaction which people I find expect of local government representatives. And the aspect of that that I find interesting and challenging goes to your issues around conflict because it almost seems at one level that the more accessible you are, the more you risk that perception of position taking. Because if I'm meeting with Mrs. Brown and her fence and then Mrs. Brown's neighbor six months from now brings a variance application to change the fence, then the neighbor can say, well, you met with Mrs. Brown, so clearly you can't have a decision or an, as uh, an aspect of this decision. Whereas what I was really trying to resolve was Mrs. Brown's problem because she has an expectation of me as a local government representative to mm -hmm. deal with her issues. So it's a really, it's an interesting, and I suspect you would call it a gray area, where we have to balance that notion of openness and accessibility with our responsibilities to keep the city's integrity intact. And I think that's, I actually think that's one of the most challenging things about being a local government representative. talk about that I think quite a bit because um, first of all and I would say that as a counselor I would hear Mrs. Brown where I would want to take action is to I might you know tell Mrs. Brown you know this is the number call here as a counselor what I want to think about is what 
are the service standards that the city has? We no, finish. I'll, I'll jump what in. What are the standards you. that the city has in terms of responding to this? Um, what report? What is our system that's in place, and how is it working? So I'd want to say to the city manager, at some point during the year, we want to know exactly what is our system that is in place in the city to service our community members on issues like the garbage, the lights, the grass cutting, I don't know, all the things you know better than I do around this. What are the expectations of ourselves as a council? What is our expectation of the city to deliver that? So we know, and I said this to a number of you when we were meeting, well, we could, we could have 1,500 people just standing, milling around the city, and Mrs. Brown, as soon as she's here, boom, someone goes right with her and, and does it. Well, that's not a good use of resources, and so our job is to say, what's an acceptable level of service? We may not satisfy 100% of the people. We may say that our goal is to satisfy 85% of the people 90% of the time, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. And then... George Bush had 51%. That was his limit. <laughs> yeah. And, and, then, um, and, that, and then we want to know, is that system working? So, Gail, can you please give us on a quarterly basis a report that's generated from, you know, the complaint report or the, you know, here are the queries and here's the resolution rate and here's the average time of resolution. Do we have this kind of a monitoring system in place? Do we need it? So think about it from a systemic level mm -hmm. so that you won't have to individually answer Mrs. Brown for the next 50 years, that you will be part of putting the system in place so that there won't be Mrs. Brown's calling you. So I think that's one is the systemic. The other thing is we have to be a little bit careful of, and I'd be interested in your views. If I'm Mrs. Brown, if I'm really squeaky, you serve me better than Mrs. Red next door. And who should you actually be thinking about? <coughs> Everybody. So why are, you, why are you giving Mrs. Brown better service than you're giving Mrs. Red? Okay, Lisa and then Jen. Yeah, and I think the, the question that you raised is, you know, the, the fence, but uh, I have a real example from yesterday. Uh, so it, one is, does, is this an acceptable level of service? But the other is, how does uh, the person who I saw yesterday who was concerned about the trees that in a park that are, you know, over her backyard, shading her vegetable garden. So th I think another important approach is how does this these trees in this person's vegetable garden fit into a larger policy issue for the city, right? And so thankfully, right now the OCP is in draft form. There's a food security or food systems chapter. So I said, okay, have a look at this chapter. Let's see if there's anything in there about you know trees and and food security is a priority. So to to push back or or provide Mrs. Brown or in this case whatever Barb. <coughs> Uh, with an opportunity to say, because I said, you know, if everybody came and said, hey, the trees are too tall, then we, you know, we can't just go pulling up trees all over, but is there a policy lever that we can have so you can grow food and the, and the park can have trees? And we decide as a group what is the acceptable policy with respect to trees and vegetable exactly. gardens and what have you, taking it up a level, and then around those discussions, yeah, where are the areas that community citizens can be engaged? Because you are individually one avenue of engagement. You're probably a fairly, people see you as a very uh, productive source of engagement because they think, hey, I talked to Shelly. Shelly's at the table. So that's really effective. Whereas what we'd like to say as councillors is that our city has a great system of engagement. So I feel as you know, a citizen yeah. that if I participate in a process that is run by my city staff that I do feel as well that I'm listened <coughs> and heard to, the more you kind of tell people, yeah, this is the best way to engage, it, it, it provides narrow engagement because it is Mrs. Brown, not Mrs. Red and the 150 other people who live in that block um, and, and so it's, it's not broad, and as a counselor, you've got to be thinking of the broad and understanding what the, you know, all the people think. And so that's a challenge when you want, you know, when you've got only the phone call from, from one person. Ben, you had a comment uh, as well. Yeah, like, um, 
one idea that basically a bunch of people were talking about the idea of an ombuds person, and so I added it to my campaign platform, and now I realize we're all sort of serving that role, and I wonder, like something needs to be fixed, I think, in how the city processes these complaints, because otherwise we wouldn't be getting so-and-so having a noise complaint and not having heard back from a bylaw officer or a dumpster on a road, and they kind of go to the councillors out of desperation, and so that's like also a part... No, but these are sh these are citizens who showed me like the email thread. They lodged a complaint December fourteenth, and then they emailed me three days ago. So something's not working there, and, I, and that also speaks to the integrity of the city because if these are our ratepayers, and I often don't lapse into a very narrow customer service mentality, but they are paying a f several thousand dollars a year to run this organization, and if it's a month before they even get a r an acknowledgement of their complaint. That's, I do feel a bit of an obligation to act. And I think it's not surprising that counselors would be the most responsive because we're the ones whose jobs are on the line. Like We can be thrown out with, through the ballot, whereas our bureaucracy is more insulated from that type of citizen pressure. So I don't know if the solution is a complaints department or what. Like Maybe just make it up front. If your tree is down on a power line, call it. And then maybe there's a way for counselors to monitor all the complaints in the hopper. If Ms. Jones has already lodged her complaint, then we can just email her back. We note that your complaint is being processed. So then you're jumping yeah. right to a solution, yes. an operational solution, not your job. But then, uh, but no, no, I'm wait, so though. Your job, though, these is to ask the city manager and her team to talk to you about, you know, and if you all think that it's an important thing to do, and I think the service of citizens, I assume, is an important thing. What you want to understand is what are the processes that we have in place currently. Do we have any guidelines around response rate? Should we have? What are the pros and cons? Okay, Ben, we have one person who handles all the complaints of the city, so and this is how enough. it fits in our budget. Well, as a group, we're going to decide, whew, that's unacceptable. We need 10 people doing that. Okay, well, this is, these are the long-term budget implications. And here's how we'll hit, and let's all brainstorm, and this is how we, well, let's, well, let's ask the stupid question and ask, what if we do, da, 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 and we go through all of that, and then we say, okay, here's the policy framework. Response rate is this, we know it's going to cost this, we're going to streamline because it's going to be interacted with this. I mean, this is what your staff will figure out, and you sit, you're setting the standards. Again, so, but to jump into, you can't jump into now. Th that's, that's what you pay these people for, okay? Well, but you're, until you're, that we fix that problem, we're going to have to deal with bet, hours of this stuff every week. If you were, exactly. And we all do already. Exactly. Like, it's a part of our weekly existence because the system is broken. So when um, Lisa was asking around how much, you know, where should the majority of our time being spent, if you spend... You know, let's say you all spend five hours a week on these sort of individual things, let's just say. Now, if you put those five hours a week with all your heads together, uh, with your city manager and the support there, here's the policy, here are the service standards, and by the way, now, can you report to us quarterly on the response time? Because six weeks response time, that's not in accordance with our standards. It should be. And then you, your lever is you take that down into the city manager's uh, goals and objectives for the year. And you say, the most of the five things that are important that we really want you to focus on and accomplish are not these other things. It's this policy and the implementation of this. And the response rate right now is at six weeks. And it needs to be down. You know, we all think it's reasonable that it can go down to four weeks during the course of the year, that's one of the things that to us as a council is a priority and we're going to flow it through. Your lever to get things done is through strategy, where we want to go, policy, this is how we'll behave getting there, and over to you staff, these are your priorities, this is how you have to work. We, under we, we set the budget that, that reflects <laughs> these priorities and we monitor, report, we get the reports back and say, hey, you're doing a great job, or hey, you're not doing a good job. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, 
we don't do enough training of our staff. Or the problem is our technology is so slow that it's always breaking down. Or people just aren't working hard enough. Whatever it is, I'm you find out though. and then I, you push and I think it's always going to be more of a hybrid. People are going to go to their elected people as a first point of contact, and I think the best solution is probably more of a hybrid between a staffing operational response and a democratic engagement response. I don't see us ever having a role. I'd like to not have a role. I just don't see it happening. This Someone is always going to stop you on the street, and it's a bit of a communication. Well, we stop you. you will not stop people from contacting you, yes. but you have, you have to decide <coughs> what your effective way is to create a good healthy city that is responding yes. to citizens. But even the way we communicate back what the city is doing, that reflects our need to know the processes well, that the are in process place. Yeah. We won't resolve the process here, right. but Mr. Mayor, you had a comment. Uh, yeah, and I'm trying to avoid jumping to stuff um, of, of, of what bones exist and then the meat that exists. I mean, and again, it's just the benefit of a home council. We've gone through this uh, as individuals a thousand times. I think then, so for the parking lot is, what is our role and is there a role and how do we set up a process, for lack of a better term, um, for appeals from staff decisions? Um, and, and that, to a certain extent, is the issue. I mean, the first question is, have you talked to staff about this? You know, and we have our certain responsibility that says, you know, like, as you said, resources is an issue, so our bylaw enforcement follows the following process. Um, you know. Um, is there a health and safety issue? So the reason why they might not be getting to this noise complaint is because there's people living in buildings that may burn down that they're doing. So health and safety. Then it's then it is is the city going to be sued? That's a good one. So then the third tier is major nuisance, and fourth tier is minor nuisance. And so sometimes it may take us a long, long time to get to that minor nuisance. But the problem is, is Mrs. Brown in her fence doesn't know that there are 1,400 issues that take up. And part of our responsibility is to convert that back, but to say, have you talked to them? And that's the process issue, right? And it's about informing. So if you find out that, in fact, this is why it's six to eight weeks to get back, and you might say, hmm, our reports show that we're actually getting 1,500 complaints from people because they don't get a response earlier than six weeks, we might say, city manager might, might suggest, ah, I think we should have maybe the email that goes out that says, uh, we these are all the things that we consider. So it may be a matter of in our system, we need to be better informing people. So you will never stop those people from stopping you, talking to you, complaining to you about they think they're not getting enough of a server standard. But the question for you to decide as a group how will you deal with it most effectively so that you don't spend all your time on what is relatively an important issue to one or more people, but in the big scheme of things, relatively minor compared to the big issues that you have to decide as a council. Because if you are distracted, if you spend all, you only have finite time, you have finite time together, you have finite time as an individual that you spend on your job, that's a lot of time, but it's a finite time. You also, I mean, when you think about the time that you spend in a month where you're using your brain power and all your energy, and you allocate how much of my time in a month do I want to be spending on different types of issues? You want to be spending the majority of your time on really um, big picture, making the city stronger and better and what have you. Bring back to my first suggestion though, was that maybe the city needs a complaints department, which would completely allow us to not deal with this. But it would allow us to, but maybe it's the people who are getting the complaints who will actually come up with a suggestion like that. Like Gail's not getting those emails, we are. So is it, is it a, a bad thing that maybe I'm the one recommending it? I'll leave it there. Yeah, but. And the other thing is, is, is Perhaps the first and fundamental thing you do as counselor is you forward the email to Gail. Hi, Gail. Got this complaint? Oh, but then it's also counselor required. Counselor so required. That gets into staff relations, but see, I don't want to sap all my all the time, like because there's substantive requests for information that I need to make policy decisions, and I've been focusing my inquiries to Gail, to Rob, to other directors. 
higher level requests on that plane. So to bother Gail with the mundane, I'd be worried that my substantive requests would be lost. I think the intention of the counselor inquiry is that it's captured and we can report against it okay. in terms of turnaround. One you know, thing that this council is going to have to really um, put their attention to is capacity. Mm. We don't have, and, I'm, and we're going to, before you go into your strategic planning, we are going to do a presentation about some of the issues we are dealing with and capacity. So I think before you get into priorities, you need to understand the, the reality of the City of Victoria. Mm -hmm. But but the council inquiry was intended so I wouldn't get a thousand emails, right? And that we can a, can in fact report against it in terms of turnaround. And we do have a follow up where if they haven't, you know, if it isn't in a certain number of days, we do have we do have a mechanism for that person to follow up. Okay. And that's why we did it because I was getting all of these emails, mm -hmm. and I don't have Hi. enough. So to be able it to. may be that the systems aren't as good as they should be. That could be. Okay, so nobody's saying we won't deal with it. It's just that as a counselor, think about where your lever is. Your lever is not, you're right, you're, you're, you're already jumping to all of these solutions down here. But you're right, you also said maybe someone who works in that department would have a really good solution. That's right. That's Gail's job figure out the solutions, your job, figure out the priorities, service standards, understand the systems, report back, get that information. As a counselor inquiry, you'll get some reports back. I mean, part of it, I know that <coughs> when you're new, you're you know, still learning everything that's in, in place. I guess all I'm doing <coughs> is saying, think at this level, make changes at this level, monitor at this level, and we will never not talk to Mrs. Brown, but we're hoping that we'll get less calls from Mrs. Brown and the others. Now, I had a number, Charlene, Chris, Lisa, Jean. It just because there's been quite a lot of uh, dialogue, and, and so my mind sort of thinking of some of the comments that were made. Uh, first comment I want to make and is, when I think uh, for me, when Ben said the systems are broke, I guess my, my sort of defense system went up, and I think it goes to the fact that um, it's, 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 it's a living thing. So, mm. so we're always improving on things. We're always learning. For example, you know, when I deal with bylaw, you know, a lot of times a bylaw doesn't create it until someone realizes there's a problem with mm. something that was never a problem before, mm -hmm. and now we need a bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's people bringing in soil so they can have a better view of their house. We never thought of that before. But also, we have bylaws that um, times have changed, and the mm. bylaw needs to be updated. So it's, it's a living, breathing mm. thing. And I think because we've started to deal with customer service, that's that balance of uh, being responsive and, and wanting to provide customer service. And and I know, you know, I, I, I have mentioned that part of the frustrating thing, but also the, benefit, the best part of the, the job is we deal with people every day, whether we're in a grocery store, whether we're going to a movie. <laughs> and people will say, you know, my light bulb's out, uh, you know. Can, and, and it's wanting to be able to provide the customer service by saying, you know, let me see how I can respond to your need. And so it is something that now, you know, when we've talked about it, whether it is something we need to find a way um, to make the system a little bit, you know, I, I, you know, it's, when you're doing it every day, you think it's seamless, but we, we, sometimes we don't know what it's like for that customer mm -hmm. to come and is it seamless for them. And I think that's something with Dick Gale, we're starting to work on the customer service issues. Uh, that we're starting to see improvement, and I I'll think, come back yeah. In so April of strategy, customer strategy. Yeah. We're so Gail and Rob, I was also going to ask that um, because the individual, the connection with individual community members, is an important part around counselors' activities. Uh, just thinking about the orientation in the future as well. Like I think this is a great thing to talk about here, and we're going to. I'm going to take it to the next level, which is those that want to lobby you, like oh. developers, environmentalists, you know, whoever else has a particular interest. Um, so I, I think, you know, we'll talk about that, but it also speaks to uh, things like connecting potentially with a mentor, with someone who's been on council for longer. I know you're doing that informally, talking to each other, because there's probably things in place that you know or don't know and should know. Rob? And, and we're alive to the the whole issue of complaints because we do want to get you to the place where you are dealing with the policy and the strategy mm -hmm. and not as much on the on the minutiae. 
So we are working on these different types of policies. Generally speaking, there's three sort of different types of, of complaints that we get. It's the service standard, the lights out, my garbage wasn't collected, real routine stuff that we need to get directly to the service provider in the organization so that they know that there was something missed or there's something needs to be done that really doesn't need the involvement of people. That being said, it might be two weeks for a light bulb to get replaced. Garbage collection usually gets picked up pretty quick if it's been missed. There's a whole series of complaints that relate to the quality of the service. It might be that a, a, a poor decision was made, um, staff were not uh, respectful, they were rude, um, something was done sloppily. You know, those types of complaints we want to route into the supervisors and the managers so that they can make staff accountable for behaviors and, and, and attitudes and things like that. And then the third set you'll always own, which are the, this bylaw is out of touch with reality today. And I need a counselor to recognize this and to advance this issue forward into the council discussion so that our zoning bylaw can be more up to date, so our noise bylaw is more up to date. So there will be a set of these types of policy complaints that validly you will always own and we will force onto your table either through staff or through the uh, citizens bringing those concerns to your attention. So we're wrapping our heads around this, we're sort of developing policies that reflect what we consider to be three different streams of, of complaints that you get in the hopes that you get to focus on the value added ones which are the citywide policies and bylaws that govern how we act as, a, as an organization. So it's not that they're not important, it's just that how, what's the most effective way to ensure they're dealt with? Mm -hmm. That's really it. Yeah. Okay, Chris, Lisa, any, any, something Thank you, you and it's, it's also understanding the way these uh, different tools we have available to us actually can be enhanced over time. So Ben, you and I had a long discussion yesterday about the counselor inquiry and how to deal with that. Um, what I've found over a number of years now having it in place is it's useful when somebody brings a complaint, say, please email me, email me the complaint mm -hmm. of the issue. What I will do, and I explain it to the public, I have a counselor inquiry button on my computer mm -hmm. that I just punch it up and says, here's the complaint, I forward the complaint to them, please respond to the people and CC me. Mm -hmm. So then there's a loop, and the counselor inquiry uh, response time, you get an immediate response saying, uh, we will have, the, it will be distributed to the most appropriate response department, and it will come back to you within three working days. So as soon as that's done, it begins to close the loop. What happens then is the counselor inquiry desk can take a look and say, oh, we've got eight different complaints from Mrs. Brown about her fence mm -hmm. personalized to each of us on, okay, that's one thing. Or there's 14 different emails from different people about the same issue. This is something we should be beginning to look at on a policy basis. But that's, can it be improved? Of course. Um, but it, it actually has been a very useful tool, at least for me, over the last couple of years that we've had it in play. And it's just, you learn how to use the tool properly. There's which no is doubt that if you were in a corporation, a <coughs> board of directors would n never be involved to the detail. But because you are a different kind of organization, mm -hmm. you are going to get those direct Absolutely. contacts. That's okay. It just means, what's the system to deal with it? Is it working? Where, what do we do with it? How do I understand that? How do I know that? So, it, again, you know, is there something that is a guideline for counselors that tells you about how that works and talks? Because if this is an issue that is of major concern to everybody because it's a recurring, recurring thing, then we need to know how to deal with it. Lisa, Shelley. Yeah, this relates to what Dean said and what you said earlier, and it may be operational, but I think it's, it's a, actually a communications piece. It would be great in the same way that you said if we have something on our website that says, hey, this is how council discusses and this is how council makes decisions. <coughs> if there's somewhere on the website that says, these are the priorities, priority order in which complaints are addressed, health and safety. Mm -hmm. You know, it's simple. Then we can just say, hey, check out the web page. You're complaining about a fence. Well, the, you know, it's very simple. We just point people to that, and they know that it's not that we're ignoring them, but someone <coughs> is living in an unsafe situation. Mm -hmm. We have the city has priorities, and then mm -hmm. that's easy. Right. Yeah. Good point. Shall we? Well, similarly, in the sense that before I was elected, it was when it, I would be the one that would phone about the lights out and the garbage not emptied and the lawns not mowed. And as a resident, and it took me years to figure out who to phone. Was it CRD? Was it Victoria? Was it Parks? Was it Engineering? And I think we need to empower our residents once again with yeah. using the website to say, go to this page, 
that's what will help if you have that issue and it'll tell you who you need to contact and that way the department if they get 25 complaints the yeah. department heads will see and wow someone's not changing the lights as often as they should be changing the lights rather than because since I've been elected I haven't been phoning because it felt awkward mm -hmm. so I didn't yeah. but I've told others yeah. who to phone <coughs> and how to go about doing it and yeah. you know but I think it would be better to have that citywide I think there's a couple things one is absolutely tell Mrs. Brown what she needs to do and there's probably something there's probably something on there maybe it's not as accessible if you're all raising this and it needs to be more accessible you can address that um, also number two tell Mrs. Brown how a counselor deals with it this is what a counselor does we have a button on our computer, counselor inquiry, number one. Number two, we think about policy, we think about systems. This is how we do it, we have a system, we get reports, we get quarterly reports, we monitor it, we set service standards, blah, blah, blah. Let them know what you do and that you're interested about the fence, but this is kind of the role that you play. Not to take away that you're not gonna listen or help, but I think that, again, part of that. Only because I, I think it's important to forward debate. I apologize if longer. Um, my experience in the past is if, if council stays down here, then we keep our senior manager and everybody down here as well. And, and I've seen one where, I think my famous example, it's where uh, Councillor Young at the time emailed and said, there is a basketball hoop on a boulevard in Fairfield. Uh, and I was a councillor at the time, but strangely I walked into uh, engineering at the time. And then I saw at the time different people, but manager of engineering, head of transportation, three or four other staff sitting around a BlackBerry trying to figure out how to answer that counselor, right? Um, and, and it's a recognition that council has power. Mm -hmm. When we phone and say, can you do something? This isn't Mrs. Brown saying, I got my pants. This is, uh, so, so we have that and, and we have to be aware of that effect. There may be times when we need to phone and say, Basketball's out of control in Fairfield. We need to do something. Uh, and it's the biggest difficulty. I think the other one we've had is, you know, like four or five people phoning and saying, uh, this little league basketball, uh, this little league backstop, we don't like it. Children are too loud. We don't want dangerous something, something dangerous. And, and how do you balance the 600 families that play baseball versus the people who live next door to the park saying, get rid of them? And that's, that's, yeah. that's no, the tough spot. I think, I think there's two great points. One, I do think that the level, you have obviously a whole organization full of people. Your senior people also need to be spending the majority of their time at this level. So number one, make sure that the people here are dealing with those the, the areas that they're supposed to. And number two, I think is another great point, is that you do have this um, perceived power as an individual. And I say perceived because of course, you only have power when you're sitting in the group and making a decision. That's where you only time you have real power. But to staff, <coughs> when they get a call from a counselor, they think, I better jump because ultimately, you're their boss. You're the city manager's boss and it all flows down. And so you have to be very um, aware of that and not abuse it knowingly or unknowingly. Just, just so you know, the, the pun was, because we've been talking about Mrs. Brown's issue, one of the ones that the mayor mentioned was actually a Mr. Brown. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the coincidences of that? <laughs> and perhaps the, the worst thing I've seen happen is my first term, so nobody was here, but individual counselors would try and connect with directors or managers to get their special project done. Yeah. Um, I'd, and, and it sort of circumvented all of council stuff. Uh, then sometimes individual managers and individual directors would try and get counselors to, if they could get a champion, then they could get their pet stuff done. Uh, but then because it wasn't a council decision, in the end, nothing happened. Because you'd come to council and council didn't approve it and everybody got froze and then it became a game of whack-a-mole. Every time a director put their head up, they got whammed. And, and anyways, it just, it was totally, so I mean, part of the reason why we're here is because if we can stay there and operate as a council decision, then it, it takes that individual piece out, so. You are elected to be a governor. If you want to go and fix the lights, apply for the job down in the light, <laughs> the light department. Now, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, or a lot facetious, obviously, but keep yourselves up at this level because that's where you have the greatest impact. That's what you were elected to do. You were elected to lead, not to go and deal with little problems, to ensure the city 
is dealing with all those little problems. Your job in this organization is to lead. And that's where you've got to constantly keep your, your head thinking big picture. It's not that we don't care about those things. There are systems where we, where we want to make that happen. But if you stop leading, the whole system is going to not be as productive. Just wanted to find, and I think actually this may have been as well on your, on your parking lot about, so this is a very sort of obviously simple um, overview, but it would, might be helpful, Dean, to have you comment a little bit about um, some of the challenges that you see or in your role. What, I mean, what I said here is that the mayor has the responsibility to preside at meetings. I talked earlier about the fact that he tries to manage this. He's got to get everybody an opportunity to talk. Don't talk too much. Don't talk too little. Don't repeat things that have been said. Uh, say things that are enhancing the conversation. Don't just talk to grandstand and hear yourself speak. Make it all productive. He has to try and manage all of that to the best of his ability, but can only do that when, when everybody's really on the same page. Um, and then the communication on behalf of, of council, being the spokesperson for council, um, you know, and how does that relate uh, is challenging and reflecting the will of council. So we've certainly seen and heard of situations where decisions have been made where the mayor was not, no, I'm not talking here, in other situations, where the mayor was not in agreement with the decision, you know, wasn't what the mayor wanted to do, but the mayor goes out and sells that because that's the council decision. So the mayor kind of represents, he's got a big job to play, uh, liaison with the city manager. So taking the will in between meetings, working, planning up the, uh, helping to set the uh, sort of agenda and what's going to be on there in that liaison. It's a, it's a big role and it might be just, maybe you could put a little flavor on that and, and any sort of questions or feedback from people, we could spend a few minutes on that. I mean, I think the, the fun one is always reflecting the will of council, especially when you don't agree with it, uh, because you don't get to come out and say that. And it's always the difficult position is, is when another councillor no longer reflects the will of council, uh, then, then what's your responsibility of mayor? And it makes it even mm -hmm. hard when you actually might agree with that individual councillor saying, yeah, I'm with you on that one. Uh, but you have to say, this is. So that's a difficult piece, and, and, and so it would be important to recognize that what is our role around that? You know, when council makes a decision, you know, what are our individual council roles and stuff, just so we understand where people come from. It's a discussion we've had before. We can't fetter our own personal or political um, position, right? And that may be where we are, but just as long as we have an understanding of what's going on there. The other one, which we've touched on briefly, but will be helpful, is, um, is council will come up with, here's how we choose to behave, right? And these sort of things and these responsibilities, but ultimately uh, a mayor is just one of nine that that all of council has a responsibility of backing up. Um, I mean, I know my tendency in the past is I have a tendency to take on the, uh, the honor of council. And so um, you have a tendency to be, almost be more personal. Oh, God, you know, don't say that. That's embarrassing. Um, and so you, I may overreact on, on times. Um, but at the same time, understanding that um, uh, council has a role as a, as a group and as a role to, to play in if you don't like what someone else is, is uh, if someone is now, how do you put it, breaching what we think is that social contract among all of us about how we're going to go, what is our individual council role knowing that? Um, it's yeah. not an individual mayor versus a, a council piece. It's, no, no, this is council's will. Yeah. And my role is just to deliver the message. Right. And that, that sort of is a good segue into um, the discussion that we'll have in a few minutes, which is what are the expectations as to how we will behave and can conduct, conduct ourselves and carry on our business during the term um, because we should all kind of agree on that. And then Dean, in terms of, because of the leadership he role he plays in organizing and presiding over meetings, has to try and carry that through and help remind us at times if we, now, we all should be reminding ourselves that and if somebody's sort of really out of step there maybe others can help. It doesn't just have to be the mayor, but we kind of put it on the mayor. It's written into the job description, um, but it's it's a great point that it you know trying to reflect that is a challenge. Challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Will there be um, further opportunity to discuss the issue of reflecting the will of council, yeah. both by councillors and the mayor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be that discussion. next section? No, go ahead. Well, now or oh, 
Um, or are we parking that no, for? we can talk about that now. Well, I think it's one area where clarity is really, really important. I mean, I've certainly been on boards and organizations where um, it, the expectation was that we would not speak about what our our position had been on an issue, that it would only be what the will of that group was and the spokesperson was the mayor or the chair or whatever it was. And I think that it's very useful for us as a council to be really clear on what is appropriate. And you know, my, my past practice, and I've had legal advice to support it as well, is that I'm not the spokesperson for council, I'm not the spokesperson for whether it's the PCC or the Harbor Authority or whatever, but that I still retain the freedom to speak to what my position was on a particular issue. And I think it'd be useful for us to know if that's what we're thinking our operative model is. Yeah, okay, well let, let us, uh, um, I thought you were going a little bit different direction that that's really important, so let's, um, we're going to move on to the expectations very well, but around, um, I'll put that down here again, and uh, let's spend some time talking about that. Okay, uh, right now? No, let's just wait a, a few minutes, because I just want to kind of get to that, because it's sort of grouped in with a whole sort of area of expectations. Is that okay? Yeah, no, I... Anything else specifically around the role of mayor? Yes. Yeah. That's what I wanted to find out. Okay. So when the mayor communicates on behalf of council to the city manager, that isn't, what are the, what's the word? Protocol? Uh, protocol for if we're, is that from a council meeting that he speaks on behalf <coughs> of what was decided and then talks to the mayor or is that an in the hallway, yeah, yeah, well, I'm going to talk to the, I'm going to get the staff to do X or Y. Right. Anytime, it's my understanding that anytime the mayor gets a director to do something, it should be the will of the council that he is presenting. Is it not, or is there another level of what the mayor does? Well, I think there is the, on substantive issues, and jump in here if I'm missing something in the context here, but on substantive issues, there's a discussion about here's what we've decided, here's what we need to do. And if they are on substantive issues around the city, those are being decided in public in any event, and you know, there's that's all ha taking place in public. There may be times when there are maybe what I would call ancillary things that are um, that that may flow from that. And if there are significant things, it's going to be a council decision, and and the mayor would reflect that. Um, what part of what a mayor has to try and do is also kind of understand his or her council and understand the needs of, of the city manager. And sometimes I put this more in the sense of the relationship side of it. Um, advice around how council meetings. So I, one of the things that I think uh, we'll talk about in camera meetings and there's sort of the legal, uh, you can only deal with certain issues in camera, substantive issues, typically in public, occasionally in private because of, of uh, legal issues around that. But I also think there's, uh, it's appropriate and necessary for a council, any governing body, to meet with its chief executive in an in-camera session to talk about process. So we, we, we liked, we didn't like the, the uh, uh, you know, the way that presentation was made, or it was too long, or it was too short, or what have you, um, and to give that feedback. And it's also appropriate for the council to meet by itself, and to say, we're happy, we're not, you, you're going to meet by yourselves as part of your evaluation of the, uh, of the city manager at some point anyway, but to talk about your own process, the way we're working together, um, if we've had an issue working together, it's appropriate for a body such as this to have an opportunity to talk about its own process and how it feels as working together. It may be that in your discussion like that, that there is something specific um, that may come out of that where there is, you know, a council will to say or do something vis-a-vis -vis the city manager, in which case one would expect the mayor to do that. In the course of working in this environment, there will be a hundred things a day that will come up where it's a letter that's being written. Does this go to council? Does this go here? That there is an advice and mentoring role that will take place. And I, sus you know, I haven't really got into this level of detail, but I, it's very common in these kinds of situations where the leader of the group has an interaction that is 
uh, mentoring, advisory, discussing things. If there are substantive things yes. and there's not clarity around who decides and if it's the mayor's decision or it's a council decision, that's the kind of thing that you should talk about and make a decision as a group. Will it require a group decision or a mayor's decision? Um, but I can say that there will be a hundred things a day that will happen. This, I'm talking course. about substantive issues, like, yeah. like big issues that it doesn't appear to be anybody taking minutes. Do you know what? It, so it, it becomes a bit loose. Yeah. So that's well, something that a policy we could discuss yeah. to talk about it as a group. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's move on. City manager, 24/7, mm -hmm. run the place, make sure everything's working well. Support the council, help you do your good job, do all the analysis, recommendation, bring forward suggestions. I'm not going to get through to the committees. You've obviously got a committee structure, which are more of the council committees, and then you've got the related public advisory committees, um, often as part of a governance review. If one does that, one looks at are these committees all effectively effective, effectively functioning, contributing to council's work appropriately something that you might put on your parking lot to ask yourselves at one of your subsequent meetings is, you know, reflect on it. It's healthy for bodies to every few years at least kind of reflect on their structure and how it's working. But, uh, so we're not going to go into that today. Can I just ask a quick question <coughs> uh, to Rob, or when is it scheduled to have that discussion? I've uh, put together <coughs> with the administration um, a, a paper that's been distributed to you that has a bunch of recommendations that come from the administration that touch on some of the topics that are outlined on Liz's slide. Um, that's meant to be our input to the governance process. You're going to need to look at that and you're going to need to look at the issues you've identified yourselves, either individually or collectively, regarding the governance model and simply make some choices or not make choices. So would choices it be at an ordinary choice. GPC meeting or? Oh, uh, we're, we hope to get to at I'm least uh, oh, having okay. a discussion this afternoon whether you make decisions or not is up to you. Thank you. So um, let's talk a little bit about relationships and then we'll move into the expectations. But um, we touched on this a little bit around the city manager is your only employee. That's your link, I call it a lever. I'm sort of Machiavellian that way, but saying you want to ensure things are working well in the city, decide it as a group, put it as a priority. There's no direct governance link, and that's why I say you're governors and leaders between you and staff members. So across the square at the CRD, it was stated quite clearly that it was entirely appropriate for individual directors to treat the CEO, the CAO, and the, uh, the general managers, the equivalent of our directors. Uh, to have a direct relationship. Here I've learned that informally councillors make inquiries to directors, but that wasn't a part of our orientation. And all our records point to this. But that's a model for a bottleneck, and I don't think that's ever existed in this city, in the real world, that every inquiry for information has gone through Gale. And I don't think it would be a sustainable model. Inquiry, but in terms of your levers, you mm. can't go to someone underneath Gale, anybody underneath Gale, with Even as a council, no, as a no. council, you can't. But I think the information link should be explicit because okay. it took me two months to figure out that it was okay to ask Deb Day about a particular land use query from a neighborhood that I'm responsible for. So relationship, how you know how these work, this is what needs should be written down, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not uncommon if you have a question and the culture. It's not uncommon to have a culture of. We'll just pick up the phone and phone Charlie, and you don't need to go through me on every single thing. But you need to know what are the limits, what are the parameters, what's acceptable, what isn't. And that can be written down quite easily. But in terms of governance, your lever, your formality, you cannot be just doing that. Uh, two things. One, um, strangely, we actually hire and fire directors. It was one of the strange things that, that, that we also have on there. I think. What's important here is the governance link, yeah. um, and and to a certain extent, so it's, it's through Gail. There is absolutely wide open. Go and ask directors and managers information. What's this? All that sort of stuff. The key is you cannot, as an individual council member, um, direct their work. Direct their work, yeah. and specifically, uh, even as a council, it would be inappropriate for us to say, you know, we're not going to let our city manager know. We're just going to go over to Deb Day and say do this planning document thing. Yes. I mean, ultimately, we would, the city manager's job is to deliver. 
and, and that's an issue. The question is, if you're doing that, why? <laughs> You know, we're not ever going to sweat small stuff, but if it's substantial and it's going to involve significant resources, Which it has to come to council. Yeah. I think it yes. is. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to make that point. You can't be, you know, these people have jobs that Gail has directed under your direction as a council. Mm -hmm. This is important. This, these are my priorities. Gail, as city manager, uh, Bob, these are your priorities. So if they're get constantly getting distracted by you guys and Bob can't get his work done, that's not good. I don't think you're going to get that far. Okay, so we've talked a lot of this. Shared leadership, constructive. This is your lever around the performance, and you need to plan for succession. Okay, so we'll make sure all that's happening. Governance, uh, thinking about that. So practices, policies, procedures, strategic direction, systems. Governance is also monitoring, managing risks, using the resources, all the things that we've talked about. <coughs> Keep these in mind because you are a governor and management is the directing, controlling within the organization, human resources, et cetera, et cetera. So just a little something, because people often ask me, so I put that in there. Um, and again, just to um, look at how your role versus management's role. Mrs. Brown. Over there. Your leverage points. How do you how do you be effective? How do you get things done? Strategic plan, financial plan, and capital plan. Operating budget, bylaws, policies, performance reporting. So that's one of the things. Are you getting the information that you feel you need to know whether things are being done the way they need to be done? Now you can get a bazillion reports. And it will be up to you to decide what reports do we need. Well, we get financial statements. That's why we need to be able to understand them, to know how we're doing financially and how that projects on the long term. If we have a customer service strategy coming forward, one of your questions is going to be, as a council, what is it that we want to measure to know whether we are achieving these standards? How will we measure them? What kinds of reports will we get back to be able to measure them? That's how you really add value to that process because then you will measure them and, and hold somebody accountable for attaining them. And then through the whole city manager evaluation process. Okay? Now here's where we want to talk a little bit about the external. Um, I think it's important that the community can meet and, and contact you and you can engage in the formal, informal. So you have a whole citizen engagement process you need to be satisfied that it's a good one, it meets all the needs, it meets legislative requirements, plus whatever standard of community engagement you feel is appropriate, okay? Because you do represent all the citizens, and so understanding that. And the objective, as we talked about, is to get the community view, so not just Mrs. Brown, but the whole community. And, and, and I think that's sort of an important thing, because we feel like if Mrs. Brown calls, you know, I should be responsible for that, but that's just one piece of information. And you have to be very disciplined with yourself. Yeah. Just a quick example. So I have a newsletter that I send out. It has 508 people on it. I sent just, you know, asking for feedback on what, you know, in general at this point, what do people think of the proposed Northern Junk Development? 16 people wrote back yeah. out of 508. So that is to say that what, what, what do all those others think? And that's where I think it's our job to make a big picture decision in the best interest of not just the 16 people, but the, you know, whatever 508 minus 16 is, who didn't write back. Yeah, it would be interesting for you to get, like, a polling person to come here and tell you, um, you know how they, they give you that, and they say, well, our survey is accurate to yeah. 19 <laughs> times out of 20, yeah. or, you know, 75%, 19 times out of 20, or whatever. It yeah. seems like there's two levels of uncertainty in there. But to your point is how do you get the full community view? And that's why on important things, you go through the level of citizen engagement. and understanding, you know, from the level of importance, things that are really important down to smaller things, what is the level of in community engagement that's important? Because there's a cost to it, but what's a good process? And absolutely right, that the, the contact that you get individually is, is usually a very small and often a very specific um, thing, and you really have to be thinking that 
you know, the whole community and how do I get a good sense of what that is? Like, how do I, as a counselor, get a sense of what the whole community? Well, I guess I read the paper, I, I read reports, I read surveys, I have formal processes for citizen engagement where I send out information and I invite everybody to show up and I see what people say, but I also have to think about the silent majority. It's not that easy, but put it, putting it in context. Did someone? No, and I was just thinking, oft, and often the ones that are most okay. opposed or mm -hmm. totally in support, you hear mm -hmm. most loudly and most office, often, and as you said, the, yeah. the ones, and sometimes when you're out in the community, say at events, uh, that's sometimes a great time to engage people because mm -hmm. they're, they're not there for a certain purpose. You're chatting with them and all of a sudden something will come up. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes when you have specific, whether it's open houses <laughs> or, you know, you, you just draw that part. Yeah. yeah. Be the real it's finding balance. that balance of uh, yeah. getting the right to That's great. Yeah, and, you know, so think about, I mean, how many people have you got? 80,000. Mm -hmm. So. I, I know, you know, when I've had to, um, be for the mayor's open door. Um, for how, uh, the years I've done it, it's amazing how it's, uh, there's still s the s some of the same people that come every month. Um, and yet, when I've you know gone or uh, when you've gone out and say a coffee shop or something, it's a new group mm -hmm. of people that you that interacts. With. Yeah. Well, there's some that would just keep coming just to. Yeah. Just a couple points. One is that being accessible. What does that mean? Uh, because that's part of the accountability, I think, is, is being accessible to listen. But, you know, you talk about getting the views of 16 people out, out of 508. Mm -hmm. well, you've got 16 out of 80,000. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But so, but my point was that if I made my decision based on what those 16 mm -hmm. people told me, I'd be making, a, in my mind, a very wrong decision. Well, it might be a right decision. Well, it might be a right decision, but, it, but it's, not, it's not a big picture decision if I only fixate on what those, that small group yeah. says. And that's why, you know, how we balance. Uh, I've had these five people that have been phoning me every day and, and, you know, persuading me, persuading me, persuading me, persuading me, and then maybe I have some kind of general citizen engagement report that says this, but, you know, I see that in a document or whatever, somehow it doesn't make me feel as compelled as the five people that are like boo 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 like a woodpecker on my brain, um, that's part of your own discipline. You know, your discipline is to, to think broadly. Uh, Dean and then Fred. Well, the, uh, the interesting thing about this, especially I think probably in, in the question of land use, is that our fundamental number one way to get input is the public hearing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so as we start to open up and widen and, and talk about community consultation, how do we do it, and mm -hmm. what people are saying on Facebook, and, and, and all of those sort of issues, uh, we need to figure out, you know, <coughs> the public hearing, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's, because to a certain extent, I mean, this goes back to another one is, and thank you for sharing, because otherwise, I never would have known what those 16 people had to say. Or, you know, yeah, I said and we should probably friend each other on Facebook so you can see what people are saying on my post. But at the same time, not every counselor is getting the same information. Like, yeah. And that's the benefit of a public hearing is that everybody gets to hear from that one person or those 20 people or whatever show up at the mm -hmm. same time. So can I just take so. a couple of slides ahead and then continue this conversation? Sure. Because Welcome I'm going to take it to the next level, which is around the specific lobbyists. So let's take land use. Let's take a developer that calls you or you or you, um, and I, my own view is that you want to make sure that people have access, they have fair access, and then it's fair lobbying, and it doesn't Im undermine the public. So what does that mean in practice, right? So you've got some legal boundaries, okay, don't go over the legal boundaries, but beyond the legal boundaries, I think there's probably quite a wide range of gray, you know. Uh, there's 16 people, what, what do you do with that information that come back? So I think you have to um, sort of we, and talk about this, sort of what are the boundaries and the goal, as we said earlier, is always to protect the city and the reputation of the city. Mm -hmm. So what would be inappropriate? Okay, some of these, I, <laughs> even as I was reading them, I thought, well, I hope no one's offended because I'm pretty sure nobody here is going to be doing this, but, you know, we can take it from some of the more serious things, like on accepting bribes. Okay, bad. 
accepting political donations in return for favorable exercise of discretion. Okay, well, how do we, how do we deal with that? We probably will have people that give us money and we'll have certain objectives and I am going to be voting on something that will affect them. So thinking about how do we separate, so what we want to make sure is we're not combining these activities. Um, if I grant access to one group or another, I will only talk to you. I'm not interested in talking to you. Uh, giving promises, I will do this. That's a con you know, what Lisa talked about that concept of being open, right? When you get here, that you have, you do a lot of information gathering, and you're going to um, put your ideas and your perspectives forward by being open to really hear what other people are saying and why and understanding that. You can't give, be giving promises that really you've made up your mind before you get into the room. Directing staff, disclosing confidential information while being lobbied. So there will be times when you are privy to confidential information for competitive reasons, uh, business reasons. Um, obviously you have to be careful about that. Um, being unduly influenced. Uh, this guy's my son's hockey coach. He's a great guy. I make him happy and my son gets to play forward what she really wants to play. <laughs> Whatever. It's a simple example. You can extrapolate it in any way you want. So this is the kind of thing that, again, I don't think today we're going to get into a full debate on this, but these are the kinds of things that one could talk about and say, do we agree with those principles around having these kinds of conversations? Um, and we should probably just bookmark because there's a huge bunch of legal stuff around the whole sort of bullet too, about the link between political donations and stuff. Just so people understand. Yeah, so you want to make sure, for example, and you may have some specific policies in place that do articulate that, or if not, I mean, I think that if and when you write some policies around here's how we do things, here's how we engage and do some don'ts or guidelines, that kind of thing. You want to make it as easy as possible for counselors. So I don't have to look in that policy manual and that legal opinion and what have you to understand how I should conduct myself. It's really easy right here in Council 101. And I also should make it really easy for people in the public. So I know that that's the way these guys operate and that these are my obligations as someone who wants to engage them in a conversation so that they know that as well. Um, so. Yeah, just want to bookmark it for yeah, no, Tom or Rob to deal with at some point. Yeah. So if you, oh, so some suggestions around better practice, particularly for high profile. I guess for any matter, really. But thinking about it that if you're in the middle of buying eggs at the 7-Eleven on Saturday morning, the kids are waiting for pancakes, um, you're not going to be sitting down and, oh, just a minute, let me just pull the oh, I have notepad out of my, my, uh, my jacket pocket. But thinking about um, how would you, when you meet with people, do it in a way that's transparent? for yourself, for other counselors, um, obviously documenting meetings so you know what was said, protects you as well as other, uh, conducting the meetings in official locations, so. There's a logistical challenge around that and a lack of meeting space. So I would prefer to have sort of my open office in a committee room here at City Hall, but in the absence, like our shared space, it's too loud. We'd be disrupting our colleagues. And if you want a table rather than sitting at a couch, our lounge is out of the question. So, Well, but in our orientation, I did raise it with Rob, and he talked about the logistics of all eight of us taking an hour a month would add up to a full day. And I guess that's a discussion maybe council has to have if that's a reasonable use of city r meeting rooms. Yeah, so, I mean, that's obviously a conversation that you can have, Marianne. I just on that specific day, the alternative is to use public space that's free that at the community centers. Mm. I think everyone has had that conversation of issue of assembly liaison neighborhoods, and community centers, in my experience, are thrilled to have a counselor come at a fixed time for a couple of hours, and it becomes publicly known 
is publicly acknowledged through people around watching you. You have staff there. Uh, not our staff, but their staff. I remember a lot of this is not because we're saying, as a counselor, you're doing something bad or wrong. It's around the perception that you give. Oh, I saw Marianne and X off in a small little back room table in a private room, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, versus uh, Marianne has regular two hours at the, you know, such and such community center, and I saw this person go in there. It's a different feel. The information exchange may be no different, mm -hmm. but it does have an impact. And all of these things together create a culture of how you work, how you are seen, how your decisions are seen, and how you interact with each other. Because I also was like, oh, I see Chris and he's always off in the back room with all these people. I know he's got a secret agenda. You know, it's like, that doesn't help me feel good, like I want to be open with you about what I'm hearing. Whereas if we think, okay, well, I've got to try and get the views of everyone, and each one of you has your own way that you receive input, how would I know? So having other people present, that's just um, also an aspect of protecting yourself because uh, you know, two people speaking about what happened is better than one. Um, inviting lobbyists to seek a meeting with all counselors. Well, you're phoning me, so talk to everyone. Providing copies of information or communication. Here's what someone gave me, and I'm circulating it. And when people are being asked to give you something, knowing that it would be circulated, that that's part of your, your policy, there's no secrets here, we're all available and accessible and uh, you know, happy to chat with you and here are the times when I do that and here's what I do with the information and thank you very much. Asking for things to be put in writing. Uh, sometimes people are much more likely to say or say things or be inappropriate if, there, if someone might have a tendency to do that when it's verbally and there's no sort of record of it. So it's, people have to be more thoughtful when they put things in writing. And uh, disclosing the lobbying activities that you've been subject to. Here's who I talked to. Here's who talked to me. Here's who phoned me. How comfortable would you feel doing that? Everybody's and what daytimer is FOI. What's that? Everybody's daytimer is FOI. Right, it's FOIable, but are you proactively putting them in? <laughs> disclosing it, right? But these are all the kinds of things when you say, oh, we had these kinds of kind of guidelines about how we did things. Um, documenting meetings, you know, again, there's, there is some proportionality that may go into this, but thinking about just being purposeful. I guess when I think about governance, good governance in today's environment, I think about it being purposeful and proactive. This is how we do things. We're planning proactively how we're going to be conducting ourselves, and we're doing it this way for a reason, to all support good, healthy, decision-making, open and transparent government, blah, blah. Shelley, you had a comment? So the better part, like disclosing at council, that seems like each one of us would say, yeah, I met with Joe Blow, and I met with Susan, and talked to the neighborhood at the beginning, yeah. at the outset. Not removing well, yourself from the discussion, but saying, I have had many discussions about this in this yeah. issue in the past three weeks. It's That's a, a disclosure. Yeah. Right. So when Shelley gets up and says, definitely those roads should be painted brown, you can say, you can put it in the context. Well, she's met with all the red, green, yellow, and blue people, yeah. so she's kind of heard all the arguments. Or, she she met with the brown people 15 times in the yeah. last three weeks, and she's never even listened to the others. Now, that could be a big make-work project, so I'm not suggesting that we do a big make-work project. But you get an idea around the concepts Concept. of openness, transparency, good cool. judges. And judgment. There's no. You must be. The legal boundaries of what you can and cannot do, you must abide by, period. And those need to be clear and plain for you in, a, in any situation so that you 
do not get offside because you will jeopardize city decisions and you will cost the city a lot of money because they're going to have lawyers and fix it and you know try and deal with it and what have you. So I am not talking about let's set up guidelines on legal issues. Here's the black and the white. But beyond the black and the white, um, the nature, you, you are required to understand the community, but um, if you only met with developers and you never met with environmental people and you said to them, I won't meet with you, or vice versa, then you would be seen really as always an advocate as opposed to a governor. But what if we ran on a mandate of being an advocate? You had ideas, people elected you, your job here is to govern on behalf of everybody. But what if the people want an advocate at the table? Your job is to be a governor. But what you if the people leader. disagree with that? How many Just people elected you? 8,000. 8,000. 8, 8, so 10% of the people. Yes, but why do we make assumptions about the views of the, the... I don't know if there is a silent majority. Like the same way Lisa only heard from 16, it doesn't mean that we assume the other 480 have the diametrically opposing view. No, but you need we to know no what idea. they know. You need to know what they think. Yes, and I think we should try to. Yeah, take so that's steps. all we're saying. We're not saying don't okay. listen to the eight. But I just think it's a little to suggest we have to strip ourselves of all our the fire in our belly. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a recipe for good government. Do you have a fire for a healthy Victoria that's successful in the Certainly. future? Certainly, that's the fire. Yeah. You have ideas about how to achieve that that are. You know, mm. per perhaps from a policy or a substantive perspective, or different from than Lisa's ideology or, or values. Or but to get your job is together with this group, figure out together. You don't get to decide. I know I don't. I have one vote. You have one vote. <laughs> but your job is to talk to everybody here and together um, decide on that vision. So. You can you don't don't lose your don't lo lose your passion, but if you don't approach it in a way that is broad based and informed, broad based, your fellow counselors are going to dismiss you quickly. He's a one trick pony. He I'm not saying I'm not taken the time to do that. Yeah. His questions don't indicate that he has any interest in considering any other aspects of this issue. Mm. Um, you're going to get pigeonholed. If you look as someone. I mean, I've seen so many groups working together, and the people who get the respect and carry the day are those that really listen and take the best of what everybody's suggesting and try and pull that together, or they say that question of, what about if we looked at it this way um, and this perspective? And to, because, you know, the idea here is that nine heads are going to be better than one. Mm -hmm. That's the concept. And so, that doesn't mean don't lose your passion. Mm. Put your passion to be part of a, of the team. And if everybody put their passion and was passionate that way and had an, a, a constructive debate and outcome to be the goal, you're going to come. And you're not going to, everything's not going to go absolutely your way on every perspective. But if together, you know, there are other people that say, I know you've always thought that way, Ben, but what if you looked at it this way? And you might think, yeah, you know what? I was already saying that. I've been convinced we can waive parking requirements for buildings. Our first meeting that I was at, I spoke against it. The, the last meeting before yeah. I took my oath. So it, I've well, already been persuaded to shift on that one issue. So. I think it's always, like, when you come in, must be from for new counselors, you know, when you come into the position, you also always have all kinds of perspectives, expectations based on your own experience and the people that you're that are talking to you. You don't have access the same way to kind of the broad things, but you're here now. Um, your job is the totality. You are a leader and a governor. I think Rob, did you have something in that show? Just I think uh, one of the issues we discussed, Liz, on Friday was there's sometimes you could look at it as a funnel so sometimes you are very constrained in the types of um, uh, engagement you can undertake because the process says you've got to follow these legal yeah. principles yeah. at other times it's quite wide and you've got great discretion to hear from all sorts of people and the procedural rules around that are are either very loose or even there aren't any so it's being mindful that 
you move seamlessly through a bunch of different roles that can be very narrow and prescribed legally by different legal principles to very wide, unfettered opportunities to engage people uh, where there are no legal principles or fetters on how you undertake that consultation. And the trick, the art, is figuring out where I am at this moment in time on this particular issue in terms of a process that might be very uh, prescriptive legally um, because of, of the statutes. And how we can best help counselors is to try and articulate that in a place, in a policy, in a guideline that tries to, and you, you know, I'm sure you have this in place, certainly on the legal side of it, but maybe fitting in that into, here's a counselor's job over the year, and during that time there were these issues where you were subject to these very strict procedural requirements, and then there will be the category of these issues here, and as a council, these are the sort of the guidelines and expectations that we've set for ourselves in terms of the standard of how we conduct our business, and that will be in there. So it's delineating it, making it easily accessible. Shelley and then Dean. Well, it all just speaks to transparency and good, good judgment. Yep. I mean, we have to have, tra well, I think you need to be transparent in your dealings and then obviously exercise good judgment. I was just going to follow the reason I wanted to chat about your only 16 people responding. It would be interesting just to follow that up if you put those 16 responses out to the 508 people and then see what type of discussion yeah. that generated. Oftentimes it's not until a suggestion comes on the table or an idea it comes up that, in, that it gets people excited and energized to participate because they want to argue what the one or two people might have had yeah. to say. So I don't think, I think that's the transparency of discussion and conversation is that once one idea is thrown out there and it's, and everybody hears it, it stimulates others to go, oh no, I don't disagree yeah. with it. So and maybe it was the I'll form of the question or how, or, or the fact that if you put the responses out, you would get more engagement. I put the responses out to the 16 people. I didn't want to put the responses out to the 508 people because I hadn't asked anyone in advance if I could share their yeah. responses. Next time I'll say, and you know, these responses will be shared with others confidentially or whatever. Anyway, that's and a good this point. Is, this is the kind of discussion you have at a council level when you're putting probably the fine tuning around public engagement because um, you will have certain rules of engagement that will be specified and then within that context there's there's people that do this for a living that figure out how to how to promote these conversations and this is a classic area where the process of engagement and your policy towards it I'm thinking now at a real formal city level has got to evolve with um, you know, different ways to connect with people than we would have had five years ago even, right? Um, and so, I mean, this, this is comments, it's just food for thought as opposed to um, things we need to decide. But it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, there's always that question that we're not corporate. Um, we recognize that, you know, we're, we're, we're a civic entity and, and we're political in nature in the sense that we're elected. Uh, there are larger debates happening, you know, at, even at the corporate level. Am I there for the company or am I actually there to represent the, the, the shareholders? Uh, those questions. Uh, it's always the one. So, how do you stay in touch or true to your base, for lack of a better term? Those are the people that worked for you, elected you, who wanted you there, sort of said you are the values that I want. And yet, at the the, the same time, um, how do you make sure that you don't introduce almost a political or federal system of, you know, the loyal government and the loyal opposition and party positions and whips and you know. The, those are the, this is what the membership said, so these are my policies. So, you know, I can't as an individual act on those. And so, you I mean, and the question is, is that the role or is that the, the vision of how municipal councils work? So, I mean, it's difficult, right? Do you have, are you working as a team? What does team mean? Are you always trying to get the biggest majority of people 8-1? Or are you living with 5-4 every time? Or, I mean, those are just some of the decisions and questions that, that we think is, is what's most functional and the best for the citizens. Uh, of Victoria and how we get things done. I, strangely enough, I don't find a lot of political stuff, you know, uh, you know, Mrs. J Mrs. Brown's fence and a variety of other things. Um, you know, the rezoning next door in the duplex, there's not a whole lot of um, left, right, or centralist, right. or all that sort of stuff. There's a whole lot of just local community people with opinions. You had a comment? Yeah, and, and not being specific to uh, Lisa's. Yeah, no, it's uh, fine. I, 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 it, so you know, it's no, I'm just yeah. using it as a, an example. I find a lot of times 
it depends on how what the question was and how the question was asked. For example, how often do I hear, for example, sometimes a CFAX poll? But because I've been directly involved with the question that the poll answered, the question is so broad, how can a citizen actually say yes or no without knowing how meaningful is it? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, you know, even from the, the, whether we're talking about the bridge, how many people, even the, the last few days, would say, you know, we didn't need to have it lift. We could have had a bridge that was one piece. And yeah. even though how many times we told we, we explored that, yeah. um, it is always difficult to ask a question unless, or, or people will tell you what they think the answer is, and they may not have all the material that we have had to base our decision. Mm -hmm. And so that, I find that always a challenge um, when you're in, you know, whether it's a all Canada's meetings or just when you're out grocery shopping, people are basing <laughs> their opinion on maybe one small piece of it, whereas of course when we're at this table, we have to look at every piece. I'm just laughing about all balance. candidates meeting and grocery shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Polar opposite. Yeah, yes. Not necessarily. <laughs> no, exactly, I know, but very similar. The mayor's similar. open a hot tub, it's, in, it's the pool, right? You sit in there because your kids yeah. women and now you've got, a, you got an eight-person yeah. discussion so going on every Sunday at four o'clock. <laughs> it happens. Okay, Gail, you had a comment? I think I was just going to add to what Charlene was saying. You will always have more information than Joe Public. No person in the community will ever spend the hours that you will spend in this role because you are the governors. So that, you know, and, and often, <coughs> as you know with the bridge even, the information is so complex and complicated that we couldn't, with all the best engagement in the world, ever get all those levels of details out. That's that's just the reality of what we live with, and that would be true of any board of directors. Shareholders would not necessarily have the benefit of all of the deliberation, deliberation and homework and you know that you have to do. You see the size of your binders and the amount of effort and that you go through to be informed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's it's, and I think the other thing in, in municipal government in particular, because you you don't really have a party. Um, you will always, every decision you make, there will be someone that will like it and there will be someone that won't. And we did an exercise, the administration did an exercise with Tracy and we mapped out all of the various stakeholders and there's hundreds. There's probably no other organization or even level of government as complicated as municipal government. And certainly more complicated in the private sector. And so I think it's what makes the job difficult. Mm -hmm because it is trying to balance, um, for, you know, competing, competing interests. And, and, and I guess you have more information than they do. You won't be able to communicate all of it or you'll be run ragged. And so it's, it's taking all that information with an open mind and deciding what is the best for the city. Well, I, I think it's the open mind part that <coughs> we have to keep constantly being cognizant of. Okay. And it, it goes to your comment about being a community advocate, and yes, you are. It's very difficult to explain to um, any community, whether it's large or small, that you are legally mandated to be open to all possibilities to the public hearing. Mm -hmm. And because they're, they're looking for some surety, as everybody is, mm -hmm. I want to know that you support this or you'll be against this. Because legally, I have to keep my mind open. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's the, the really difficult one to explain because there's passion around it. Mm -hmm. And you go, yeah, I, I understand your perspective and I'm, and I'm quite willing to weigh that into the merits, but that's difficult because people are saying, no, I want you to kill this or I want you to pass this. Then we get all sorts of emails. Right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sign the document. This is also the benefit of setting up in plain English yes. a description on the website <coughs> of your responsibilities as a governor um, and your responsibilities to all the public. Those people who know a lot about these things know that. Um, and it is easy to say it's in, a, it's in the charter, it's in this, but I think yeah. having it in some kind of user-friendly, plain language, so that people understand that you have to consider all of this um, is important. Sounds like the next edition of the Connects newsletter. Mm. So, Okay, good discussion. Let's um, 
let's move on. And as I said, so you you know you may want to sort of look at something like this. This is just a straw dog, if you will, for discussion purposes. And uh, you know, it's up to you. And this this slide is really just around the concept that I was trying to talk about that accountability is through listening and reporting and that's why I think there is this important role the formal public engagement that the council does and then also the reporting back that you do and the reporting demonstrating that you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing as a city you have the vision the strategy you are allocating the funds um, the interest of the community is being served sorry um, and the councillors are acting with integrity and purpose. So I think that um, thinking about it in that concept and how your activities as an individual councillor play into that are important. So um, one of the things that uh, we can talk about, and I think we can move on to talking about, what are your expectations as to how you will work together? And that's really a crux. We've, we've started talking about those kinds of things. I've jotted a few things down here. Um, there are areas that some of you have found more challenging. Um, you know, how do we bring forward policy decisions? How do we deal with inquiries from constituents? We talked about that a lot. How do we deal with lobbying? We just talked about that. The role of the mayor, we've talked about that. Um, one of the other issues that came forward, well, let's wait till the mayor's back, is around um, how appointments are made. These are the kinds of things where you could provide guidance on uh, to yourselves. You agree yourselves on how they will be dealt with. And then you could provide yourself some, some guidance in writing, which would help you to say, hey, we're working under this, does this make sense? Um, and you create a little more certainty. And then the, the role of committees. I'll come back to the appointments one, but I'll wait for the mayors here. So this is a question, a rhetorical question in the sense we're not gonna go through and talk about all of this today, but um, these were some of the areas that had come up specifically uh, during the interviews. So, when I think about the expectations, I'm like, my question is, um, okay, let me get back. The question's a few pages long. But the question is, what are the expectations for your working relationship and how you will conduct your business, how the council should conduct its business over the next three years? And what I'd like to do is kind of jot down the suggestions that come forward and then we'll pass that over to the administration to gather that up and if you decide that you want to take on um, more focus around the governance and how we're doing things and articulate it then we can use that list you can use that list to start feeding into some of the things that you might um, prepare on basis but um, Obviously, the importance of trust and mutual respect among the team. I agree with that. Um, this one may be a little bit more. These are a couple of quotes that I took out of um, some other or counselor guidelines from other countries. Um, but talking about endeavoring to work out any issues or difference of opinions privately, not publicly, and especially not through the media. And I think the real point here is what we were just talking about is can we, we're going to come to the table with different experiences, different opinions, different viewpoints. Is the way we're going to work together by sharing and listening and being open and focusing on our long-term strategy and coming to a common agreement? And are we going to try and do that in a respectful way so that you may not have the opportunity or want to or be able to deal with it privately but dealing with it respectfully I mean I know in some of the old days in Vancouver we had some counselors that were very <coughs> rude and demeaning to other counselors and that made my opinion of the way they did I felt sorry for the other counselors who didn't act that way um, but it also made me think you know the quality of decisions that came out of there, it, it, it diminished my opinion around that. So um, this was just a couple of quotes that I came up, agree or disagree. So just park that for a minute. Um, I also just put up for you here, they're called seven principles of public life that were developed by 
it was called the Nolan Committee in the United Kingdom, and it was really around uh, a committee that got together and consulted widely and broadly around how they felt um, people in the public service, elected people, um, and others, uh, you know, employees, people working in public sector agencies and things like that. And so they came up with these seven principles of public life. And so I thought I would just put them up there. Uh, selflessness, which is not about your own interests, but it's the interests of the 80,000. Integrity, obviously, honest and open decision making. Objectivity, uh, that it will be based on merit as opposed, so we will make decisions based on merit and thoughtfulness and appropriate principles comes in with the appointments and things. Um, accountability, that we're accountable, so we, we subject ourselves to scrutiny through our reporting and through our openness. Um, open as possible, and we'll only restrict that information when the public interest clearly demands, and I think that's your, your legal guidance on that. Honesty, this is really around conflicts of interest. Um, and leadership, that we will promote these principles by example. We will set the tone at the top when we're in those positions. So I'm setting them out, I think, in a lot of ways, their motherhood. Uh, they provide kind of a good foundation, and you may wish to say, um, if you decide that you want to develop some approach to governance, that you might use this as a bit of a foundation of the values that you hold and may wish to build your governance processes and practices around them. These were developed specifically in the public sector, um, and even though they're in the UK, they certainly, they're, re they're referenced extensively there, but also beyond that, um, outside of that country as well. So, so I thought what we would do is spend just a little bit of time talking about your expectations how do you see uh, you working together in the most productive way? What is the culture that you would like to establish? And how do you think you can best establish this culture? So the team part, the individual part. Um, yeah. What do you think? I jotted down a couple things, which dating space is a bit more of an operational side of it. We had already we kind of talked about the will of council and sort of how what we might want to say is that that we want clarity of roles. I think maybe it's really what come out, came out of that conversation of you know what does the mayor do, what does the council do, and if it's specifically in daily, but I think clarity of roles, which is also a principle, if you will, of good governance. And then I had put down transparency, open-mindedness. These were discussion points. So, um, and this one I put was informed public re our process, which I'm trying to capture that sense of um, letting the public know how we do things, what uh, the expectations of us are, so that they can put that in a better context as they are analyzing whether we're doing a good job or not. Can I add in well, or inclusivity? Inclusivity? amongst the council. What do you mean by that? Maybe talk about that a bit. Uh, I just think it's important that we all work together on issues, even though I know we don't have all the time in the world, but email is a wonderful tool so for being able to inform. Or So give some examples because um, I don't want to tweet and Twitter you every minute I'm doing everything, but no, um, so how would that on substantive issues, perhaps. An example um, would be no, I'll just tell you I have a feeling of a non-inclusive. Do you have a feeling like of, of there are people that are more in the know than others? Uh, perhaps less in the know, but more team building, not the whole council being the team. Because right. I look at it as a, a healthy council as one team, and to divide within the council. So that's why the inclusive, inclusivity is the word that comes to mind, that it's one team, not lobbying others to within the team to agree with their point. You know, it's so we all come culture. from different perspectives, Perspective. but at the end of the day, the beginning of the day and the end of the day, you're one team, and an acknowledgement of that. Okay. 
Marianne? Oh, Lisa? Well, just balancing that with the idea that we're never, we're not, we don't govern by consensus. So I think it's a, I think it's a really, I, I agree there should be a feeling of teamship here that we are one team and this team is sometimes going to vote five to four and we still need to be a team mm -hmm. after that. What's the expectation of me when I'm in the four? I didn't get what I want. Am I, uh, you know, just going to go and pout and scream and step my, and, and, we don't know. and I be don't mad know. at you? Or should I be trying to at least, you know, because I'm not going to win everything. I'm not going to be the five, and if it's five, four. So we're not saying every, we don't want everybody to be a group think. Let's make that clear. When we talk about team, we should never, ever be thinking about group think, because that's a dangerous thing. And there are some groups I work with, they say they think it's not healthy if it is a nine yes yeah, all the time. Exactly. Like some things you'd like to have that, but it may not happen. And so is the culture here that we will work hard to try and build consensus, but at the end of the day, there may not be consensus, and that's okay, that we will, um, that's part of our system, but we will then move forward and be, um, you know, respectful grown-ups and dealing with all our situations after that? Is that kind of what we're getting at? Or is that sort of what you were? Yeah, well, I, I just, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I was getting at anything. I just wanted to put it on the table that while we're wanting to work as a team, we're also not always oh. going to agree. And so there need to be, there needs to be the higher level, big picture, open-mindedness. Here we are as a team coming to the table for the best interests of the city. And then the balancing piece of when the decision doesn't go your way and what do you do? I don't, and I don't know what the culture is because I just got here. And I, I realize we're all responsible for helping to shape it. Um, Marianne, Ben, yeah. Just before Rob takes that away. <laughs> <laughs> the second to last bullet you have there, or will be inclusivity, the uh, informed public pro about our process. I think that relates back to your previous slide when you talk about the second goal of having uh, consensus, an effort towards consensus internally, and then ultimately you go to a council meeting where you're making, or a GTC meeting where you're making decisions, and individuals may reflect their concerns and issues individually, but ultimately you make that final decision on, the, on behalf okay. of the whole. But it, it was, am it's amazing to me in this short year that I've been here how many people have come and said, wow, I can't believe how many times you guys all agree or don't agree because there is very little understanding of the depth of work that happens behind the scenes amongst all the members of the team in trying to reach that consensus, or at least as much as possible, to find the common interest. And that isn't seen by the public. What the public sees is the final discussion, whether it's at the GPC table or a committee table or the council table, and they make it glimpses of the differences of opinions. But there is no real understanding of how much time and effort has gone into having this discussion with individuals, with the whole group, with whoever, to try and tweak those decisions to get the best possible result, acknowledging that it is the rare instance where everyone agrees. And I think it would be interesting for us to try somehow to bring that piece of information into the public eye. Is that yeah. something that the mayor could, or whoever introduces the subject, I don't know who that's the mayor who does it, saying, you know, this is this now we're gonna move to agenda item B and um, you know, prior to today it's had this and this and this and there were many diverse views. It's being a thoroughly argued and canvassed issues and, you know, blah 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 and do a bit of that overview and bringing us up today, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Because when you are in those, in that public domain, when there are people paying attention because they're interested, and there is some media reporting as well, I mean, I don't know if it be picked up because it's not very interesting or controversial, but I think the message that's there that, that does reflect the fact that we're, we're, we're at the end of the process now, the part that you're seeing, you haven't seen, except for those of you who are terribly interested in this particular interest, in this particular item, the weeks and months of work that has gone into, you know, it, while it's woven its way through the you know, land use planning process, for example, and why it's gone to Committee X, and then it's gone to GPC, and then maybe it went back to Committee X, and it's done this a few times, and finally here we are, you know, and we've had the public hearing, and now here we are at the, at the final decision-making meeting. Nobody sees all that, except the people who are very directly involved. 
And the sense, I think, from an observer coming to that last piece is, wow, you guys just made a decision off the top of your head. And how did you do that? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't, if that's all there was. And I think it would be helpful to creating that sense of openness and to, and to including the people who are affected by our decisions most directly by being able to have that at the very end to say, so just before we get to this point, you're right, you know, let's just take a moment to reflect. This has been on the agenda for four and a half months. It's gone through X, Y, Z processes. You know, there's been diverse opinion, opposing opinions, and the message for me is, and we have done everything we possibly can to find the common ground so that we come to a decision that is the best possible outcome despite our differences, and there have been, and this is what we think it is. I think that's an incredibly powerful message that we rarely give to the public and only those most keenly interested in any particular issue ever see. And I think that's a huge gap in what people understand about how local government works. Or, or you could have the public hearing at the outset, <laughs> decision at the end. <laughs> Just by the time it gets to the public hearing and the public are involved, we've been through all that that they know nothing of. So it, it's it's not just, I hear exactly what you're saying, I agree with what you're saying, but by the time the public gets involved, they think their opportunity to speak what they passionately believe in is at the public hearing. When we've gone through four or five months of going back and forth and looking at all the issues. So it's interesting, it's the it's the entire process, not just the segment of it. That is so yeah, perhaps that, and that may speak to a bigger issue, which is, you know, what is our process of how we bring things forward and is it the public most engagement productive yeah. and all of that, which we definitely won't get into here today. But um, well, if it's something that's that. on the radar yeah, screen you should one o'clock. One o'clock. Well Will you talk to Rob? He's got Apparently he's got a schedule. Or that's no. in our parking That's what you were talking about earlier. When are we, when are we so going to talk the, about that? Op earlier opportunities for public input, when would that be an appropriate topic? Or when, what time would that be appropriate? I think it's more around the governance process and all of that. If you're but this is so that, key is so to a lot of the conflict within our council right but now. We spoke to this afternoon when we looked okay, at the strategy of the advisory committees and how yeah. we get public input. So no, it will I be a part of the conversation. Deputy's not here to speak in the context of land development applications, but mm -hmm. it's a long process now. It starts with the applicant going out to the community mm -hmm. association before they even submit a formal application to the city. Yeah, and you have to exactly bring that really big sheet that mm -hmm. they have. This yeah. one? That's that we right. worked out with yeah. community associations and everybody. So, what yeah. Certainly, so uh, Ben has no idea. One of the things we might want to do mm -hmm. in terms of the orientation is a more mm -hmm comprehensive view of what is that process. Because we do have these flow diagrams. In terms of discussing possible revisions to the process, though, when would it be appropriate to discuss that? Um, I think you'd want to have a snapshot of what where we've been. And mm -hmm. I think there's an element of uh, the customer service strategy that relates to land development. And so there will be a formal opportunity so to discuss that. So this afternoon, though, it's so not no, contemplated? Okay. So here, yeah. no, I'm just going to jump in, because you can shoot me. And um, these are governance related. Governance is also, I mean, you've got the public, they elect you, you listen to them, they participate by giving opinions and feedback. That's part of governance. What you might want to think about is what are all the governance related things that we want to look at, review, put in context of an overall approach to governance. Don't just start picking a policy doing this. Think about it from first principles, you know, maybe those public life principles. What are all the things that we think are important within that? There's internal workings of council. There's how we do our work. There's how we engage individually and collectively with the public. Let's make a list of the 25 or 30 things that need to be covered off in that. And then decide what is a methodical way to approach that over the next three months, six months, one year, three years. Put it all on the list, keep putting it in the parking lot, but what I would encourage you to do is not just <coughs> one off here, one off here, let's talk about this today, let's hear talk about that. Let's, you know, if I were advising you, it would be make a parking lot, put it all under that av avenue of governance, and then if this is a high priority issue for you and you're going to have to talk about what all your priorities are, 
for your time, your money, and your whatever else. I guess those are two big things. Um, then put it on the priority list and figure out the plan to deal with it and methodically go through it. These things don't just happen overnight. There's lots of discussion that needs to take place. And if you um, made significant progress around just some of the things we've talked about this morning, at the end of three years, you had, would have done a good service to the next council. I don't think it would take you three years, but it, it won't all be done in three months, I can tell you that. You know, a year, 18 months to make a real difference with something that's thoughtful, thought through, substantive. I know you want to get everything done in the first three weeks, but it's good. It, it will be challenging, but be methodical. Okay, um, Jeff was, uh, Ben was I'll substantive and then Jeff. Maybe I'll pass. Well, I'll, I'll just say one comment. The one word that hasn't been mentioned today is democracy. Okay. And we are talking about government not different models of how to operate a for-profit firm, local government, and our system of government here in Canada, my understanding is democracy. So I think it makes, it puts the people on an entirely different plane of stakeholder than everyone else. And I think that has to be central to how we operate. Is this around the input and listening and the reporting? It means that's central, that that can't be divorced from any parts of our process, I think. Right. So, th but that's just a comment, something that's been I've been thinking about for a while today. Um, okay, so that, that's what sort of brings in the accountability side of, of the governance as well, right? Like the public isn't only one voice. For me, it's this overwhelming voice that should shape everything we do because we are a distinct type of organization. We're an organization of the people. We're the representatives here to represent that interest. Yes. And so it's, it's, well, that should be, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Well, I agree with Ben, except that rather than the voice of the people, I see the voices of 80,000 individuals who yes. have very different views on almost every subject you can imagine, and consulting them is uh, not easy. Uh, I think um, I, I had assumed that some of the governance issues we're going to be discussing at 1 o'clock will, in fact, um, be colored by views about whether the public is getting input into these decisions. And I would say to the new councillors, uh, trust your instincts. If you, if you see, if, if it's your perception that uh, the public is input isn't happening soon enough, then that is in fact the reality. And, and hearing about all the processes and the spreadsheets and so forth isn't going to help you. Um, it shouldn't, shouldn't change that perception, which may well be a correct one. So I, I think uh, we should um, we should talk about those kinds of things. Um, I just want to dissociate myself from this whole word team. Uh, we're not a team. We are a legislative body. Now, what is important is that we, when we are discussing things, that that we do not. Um, What's, what's important about the way we, re we relate is that we don't um, allow our perceptions of another individual counselor to affect our perceptions of how we, how we approach something. And you'll certainly soon find that you'll walk out of meetings furious at one of your colleagues for the idiotic stance they've taken on something, <laughs> and then at the next meeting find them supporting you, and <coughs> with their great wisdom, and it's, you have to recognize that they, they were, they uh, maybe there is something to their views on some of the issues. So, <laughs> so I think the important thing is that in terms of our actions as a council, that we. We can't expect to be a team. We, we're don't, we don't do things by consensus, but we have to be collegial and yeah, respectful mm -hmm. of our individual views and treat each issue on its merits, um, so quite just apart hang on. from any so personal and also kind of merit-focused, merit I think, was something you put up in. Okay, carry on. You're on a roll, Jeff. Keep going. Yeah, I shouldn't have stopped in there to hear that. So I've got sort of collegial That's the word. merit yeah. focus. So really focused on the issues rather than personalities. Is that a way to say yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that my sense
sense is when people are talking about team, that they're talking about respect for the person, the process, the role you play. Um, we were pretty clear it wasn't a group thing, the side of it. Uh, issues rather than personalities. Okay, uh, Dean and then well, I appreciate very much Jeff bringing this up because, I mean, unfortunately we've got way too much mythology around team, which is, there's no I in team, you know, right. um, and, and the truth is around this table there's lots of I's, um, and, and we need to figure out some of that, that issue, and, and again, it's just being out, I remember, uh, so for example, you know, is the mayor the spokesperson? Uh, there's an expectation then if you don't agree, does that mean you can not talk about it? Because everybody agrees that the mayor's the spokesperson on the issue. How like, does that work? How, how does work? that work? How should that work? I remember once, you know, the mayor's the spokesperson, but someone had already booked, you know, uh, an interview. On, on what's the what's time. effective for the good of the city? That would be my question. I mean, you don't want to stop people saying what they think, but you do want to have. Um, like I know that you are, one of your things is focused on economic development and, um, you know, sort of, I guess, building the city in the ways that you want on various aspects. But, so that's how I would relate that question back. How we set up our pro, there are many different ways. We could just all go out and a free for all, I assume. But you have a chance to decide what do we think is kind of the way we should try and do it. What are your What are your thoughts based on? I mean, you your experience. You've been sitting in this chair's role, and where have there been times when you go up, say something, but it's someone else already booked in there? Well, generally, uh, the public and staff uh, nobody likes it when the mayor disagrees with the council. That, that's I know that I know that role. That's that's pretty a simple one to do. Um, but how do you deal with the issue of okay, so we all vote and say sewage treatment's where we're going to go by majority five four. You know, um, if you now have four people, TV, radio, continuing to work to say, no, let's overturn that decision, or, you know, I think those majority uh, decisions wasn't well founded. And, and so that, that's the ongoing issue, because that, to a certain extent, can. There's also around certainty of decision making as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and so that's the difficult between taking, being in, in a political process where you say, you know, like I may be in the minority, but. Part of my role is to convince the majority that they were wrong. And if I do my job really well, I'll have the majority of people vote for me next time and not them, and then I get to be the decision maker ultimately. So that's the difference of a political system versus, no, we made the decision, you know, are we now supposed to uh, quietly accept that that's the will of the majority in council and, and not disagree publicly, and, and then how long does that happen? And I, and I think. I don't think there's a right or wrong to that. There, there's different views. Are there certain I aspects think what's important is helpful? we understand what the expectations are. So if we decide, for example, that um, you know generally the mayor is the spokesperson as to the will of council, that we either do or don't accept um, that individual councillors who don't agree with that decision may be out there publicly taking a oppositional point, and and we need to at least have an agreement that that's okay, because that goes to respect or not respect or collegiality or not, right? So we might. So how do we do that in a collegiality way is part of the way I put it. I'm interested in, Pam, you've been in that situation before where mm -hmm. it might be a board, you might be sitting on the PCC or the airport authority or something like that, and the board says this, but as a counselor, I don't. I mean, those are the difficulties that we have. They're, they're governance issues, right? You might, so you might say, you might say as a group, what we'd like to have happen is the mayor will always speak the will of council. So if the mayor was in the minority, he would still speak and promote the will of council because that's what we expect of him. Um, for people, individual councillors who disagree with the decision, that's the question. What should guide their behavior? We might say we don't want them we don't think it's right that they not say anything. Um, we might say, and it would be good to have advice on this, that um, if if it's a decision or something, I, all, all I'm trying to think is you have third parties that you deal with as a city, and if they 
see a lot of acrimony and what have you that could cause problems for the city. So I think you've got to take that into account. So what are people's views about what you should do in those circumstances? The mayor and individual councillors, Ben and then Marianne. I think the default should be the mayor. The mayor could designate someone if they felt it fell within their area of expertise as an official, as an official decision. But I think ultimately all of us, including the mayor, need the, the latitude to speak to, to why we voted a certain way, what our positions were. From what I see, most of the reporting is actually based on the proceedings of our public meetings and the debates that happen there. So the divisions, unless we were to throw up a firewall and move everything in camera, which the law wouldn't really let us do, uh, is there is going to be divisions that are reported in the press. And reporters may ask for clarification, but largely it's Vic News and the Times Colonist and CFAX basically recording or observing our proceedings and they pointed to Pam in my, our area of division around um, the scheduling of our poet laureate. And, and so there are risks there, but I think the, ri the challenge is people who sit through the whole meeting have the context, and then reporters can pull out sound bites, but I really don't know any alternative than just to live with that and then to have, obviously to try to be responsible in our public comments, to clarify when we're asked to clarify. But I was honestly raising a valid question that I had around scheduling and so now they have Pam and I on different sides of when we... Can you send me that article? Yes, it's just online. I think it'll be, it's on Vic News or something. But I think the larger question is, we, we need to disagree yes. up until the time of decision. What happens after the decision? That's, that's probably the more important mm -hmm. one. And, and I'd appreciate your views. And, and so it's a really intense debate and a very key issue for the direction of the city. I think the minority has to have the latitude to articulate why they departed from the majority. Because they do likely represent a sizable body of opinion. Can I just pause here and second and ask, Gail, do you have um, perspectives, because I don't know the specifics of issues, um, and I guess um, the question that I might have is that um, after a decision is made, because that's what we're talking about, um, are there sort of a practicality of dealing with I don't know, other levels of government or business people or others that are depending on that decision and sort of what effect, if any, should be taken into account when that group here is deciding how they might approach this issue? I think, well, the, the question is being debated. People need to be honest with what their opinions are. And that, but I think once council has made a decision, you've had your chance, you know, to influence each other. It's tough for the administration if there's always this, is this going to be revisited? How, where do we spend resources? Um, you know, and, and it's the democratic process is, you all have one vote. Um, because I think... So there's an internal consequence. Yes. I was thinking external. And there's an external as well, because, um, you know, certainly there is an impact on communicators, because you don't want to be in a position of saying, you know, you supported one side or the other, and you know, I think the city has to take whatever the council decision is, and that was the council decision. Um, I think reputationally, once a decision is made, a decision is made, and frankly, you know, I think you, you, you need to, I think the reason, you know, that you, most of the, the work of councils in public is you bring a diversity of thought. You know, you're not always going to be on the same page. And I think while well, you're, you're um, expressing your views at council or, or at GPC, each you have a chance to hear from each other and maybe be influenced by that or not. But at the end, once the decision is made, the decision is made. And I think, you know, I hear from others that, you know, they, they just want you to make a decision. The element of danger is staff have to follow the will of the majority of council. Um, and so the minority can start to see staff as the enemy because they're not agreeing with their position and, and, and the other way around as well, right? Sort of like these minority people are now trying to change the overall. So anyway, there's just a, there's a danger zone and, and I think we need to be aware of it um, and, and just have the impact. Not saying you do or not do it, I'm just saying there's an awareness of that. I'm just realizing it's just speech, it's not changing direction, the direction council votes, the majority mandate, the mayor communicates to the city manager, 
But speech that might depart from that is, I think, an inevitable part of the messiness of a democratic system. We, we don't, we're not in North Korea guided by the principles of democratic centralism, which is when the majority decides, it, decides everyone falls in, or else. It's, it's the reality is we, there's certain issues where the, where we, the dissidents just won't fall in. <coughs> But maybe it's tone as well. Yes. I think there's part of that, I think, is actually a bit of the tone. It's not always what you say, but yeah. how you say it. And it gets a bit to, yeah. you know, speak to the merits, not personal. Um, I did a couple, I wrote a couple things down when Gail was talking. One was diversity of thought, which I think you have articulated in different ways. And the other thing I've written down is uh, staff is guided by majority decisions, that we expect staff to be guided by that. And that's, I think, important. I think I had Mary Ann, Rob, uh, I don't know, Jeff, did you have your hand up again? Uh, nope. No, I'm sure. Okay. Oh, oh. If you're looking at um, decisions that have been made and you're trying to imagine what it would be like to be in the minority and then be in a position of having to be able to make a public comment, for me it's, it's going back to something uh, that you alluded to, Ben, earlier, and that's the notion of what is a democratic government. If ultimately your goal is to serve the majority of the people as best you can with the options you have, then even as someone who was in the minority, it would be my expectation of myself that I would take care to explain the majority decision and at the very most explain the context in which I had reservations, mm -hmm. but not in the sense to say, suggest at all that that decision could be revisited, or that I was continuing to agitate for a different decision, or that I was going to now spend time and effort to try and overturn the decision that had been made by the majority. I think there is the capacity in a minor way to explain to the public, some of whom would be in the minority as well, that there were reservations that were expressed by me or other councillors in an effort to try and find that best outcome. But the best outcome was one that wasn't maybe one I imagined. But there it is. So now the mayor has spoken to that formal decision. That's the decision of council. That's what staff is pursuing. That's what the city's going to do. That's what people can rely on. The message is the decision's been made is a decision that's made with certainty. Was I happy with it 100%? No. But that's life. I did my best to try and persuade people of what I thought was the best outcome. I was persuaded, my colleagues were persuaded <coughs> in the majority in the end that it was something different. That's okay. As long as the message is that what was ended up with as a final decision is the best possible outcome <coughs> from the majority of council's perspectives, and that is the way we are going. No opportunity for second guessing. I think that's really important. I have an obligation to explain my interest to a certain extent, <coughs> my, con my considerations, my concerns, but not in a way which suggests that I'm now going to spend my time trying to beat this one over the head. That's my view. So just before we go on to the next comment, any feedback? So what I've written down here, what, what Marianne said, was if you're in the minority, not agitate, she actually sort of had explained reservations maybe up at the top here, but explain reservations, not agitate, not suggest revisiting, um, best outcome from majority's perspective. I guess that's a message. Mm -hmm. It's a way to, we're not, nobody's going to be prescriptive here. And whatever you write down coming out of this is certainly not going to be prescriptive. But that was a suggestion is um, the way to, to message that. Hmm. Any comments and feedback on that? I can't promise to be quite so generous. <laughs> there's, there's certain decisions, yeah, that I wouldn't like. If I had been on the council when it approved the streets and camping bylaw, I don't know if I would have just sat down. I may have encouraged homeless people and advocates for poor people to join me in, in urging a majority to reconsider. <coughs> so I just not sure. I think as a modus operandi for building collegiality, that's perfect. But I think we have procedures. There's a way for the majority to say, Ben, we're not revisiting it. Don't waste our time. Like there's methods in our existing procedural bylaw to prevent sort of dissidents who don't want to shut up from wasting everyone's time without having, having to have a hard and fast rule to limit the ambit of dissent. I think our bylaw already does that.
Yeah, you, I, I really like what Marianne said. I think the time to register our strong ambit of dissent is every three years. When, when the election comes up, we can say, you know what, I hated that decision, and if I'm re-elected, I'm going to push forward for this or whatever. But that's the time, I think. I, I was a bit confused when I saw the mayor's role to reflect the will of council, and then the, that wasn't part of uh, the role of individual councillors once a decision's been made. I think it should be to reflect the will of council. Sure, you can say these are the, this is the context in which I agreed or disagreed, but this is the, this is the decision that's been made, and as a, you know, as a councillor, I will... I'm not going to waste anyone's time or resources trying to overturn it. Then why do we have a mechanism in our bylaw for reconsidering decisions? Because a standard form of arbitrary rules. Right. Mm -hmm. There are occasions where you might make a decision and having complete information. And after a decision is made, new information comes to light mm -hmm. that would have persuaded you to make a different decision. So there's a mechanism in the bylaw to ensure that uh, if that situation comes along, there's a way for you to say, oh, hang on a sec, I made a decision with incomplete information. Here are my reasons why we should reconsider that. That being said, it's time limited. It does urge you to get on with the business that the decision called for. So it's, it's the next council meeting for a councillor. It's 30 days for the mayor. After that time, you can't reconsider, you might rescind, but then you've also got to weigh the consequences of uh, liability from actions taken by the city, uh, how does it harm your reputation, that sort of stuff. So I think the point that people were talking about here was certainty is a good thing. The mayor has a positive statutory responsibility to reflect the will of council. He can't play the other side of the fence if he loses. He's a winner because he's going to go out and tell people that <laughs> the council won. He doesn't get that opportunity to question the will of the majority publicly once the decision is made. Um, but we would encourage you, and in a number of cases, require you to give your reasons why you're making a decision one way or the other, because you're oh, the the person whose decision whose case is affected by your decision needs to know why. And there's some there's some circumstances where the articulation of reasons is an important process of fairness to the person whose case you're judging. Sometimes it's in the public hearing contest, in other times it's when you're taking away something, a license or a right of someone uh, through a statutory process. Okay, two more challenge. Which one I want to do first? Um, <clears throat> firstly, I want to say yay to Marianne. I think she expressed uh, what I think is when you're being interviewed, how you deal with the fact that you may um, have a difference of opinion. I can't stress enough that I think the word, that the key word of how to work at this table and in this building and in the city is being respectful. Uh, whether it's being respectful to each other, each other at the table, whether it's being respectful uh, to our staff. Uh, for example, I had a phone call yesterday where somebody just, you know, want to bring forward a proposal and said, you know, I've talked to staff and, and you know, they don't see the big picture and, and, I, and, and you know, we, you got to do something about it. And I basically said, staff are there to follow the policy <coughs> that is in place and recommend us based on that. Uh, it is the council's will to look at it and take the political decision whether we want to change the zoning, we want to, you know, um, but don't put down the staff on it because they are just responding to the policy that's in place and they made recommend recommendations or options. So I think it's really important, as I said, to, to respect the staff and uh, the colleagues at the table. I think when it comes to being um, spokesperson, I, in that uh, era of respect, I, I have found that you know when we're working in, uh, with respect, the mayor is the spokesperson, but the, spoke the mayor also sees when there are uh, in individual counselors that have been working, <coughs> sorry, on a project or been more closely tied to this, and where you know he or she may say, uh, please also contact you know, because she, that person is in charge of heritage or is the neighborhood liaison or has been working on this project, and y y you should get their input. Um, but there are, is also times when you're going to, um, for Ben's comment, when. If we voted against something, yeah, there is amount of time where you may come and try to get us to see another side. Mm -hmm. But then, <clears throat> if we don't, don't continue 
uh, to, you know, to just keep doing it. And, you know, I know there's been an instance where somebody hasn't, um, in the past, supported our stance. And we would probably, we would get a email, you know, constantly, or new articles, or what's happening in other parts of the world, and, yeah. you know, hoping that we could change our, yeah. our, our stance. And I think if there's a time to make us see maybe another side, and if we come on board, that's great. If we don't respect that, and, um, because I, as I said, it, it does put the staff also in a difficult, whether it's the Occupy Victoria, you know, there was discussions where we agreed and disagreed, and the staff were going, well, what do we do? What do we do? You know, do, do you want us to do this? You don't want us to do that? And I think to be fair to the staff and respectful, we have to make that decision and, and be clear. Um, <clears throat> it's a small day-to-day -day thing, but I've also found it respectful when we're at the table, I know sometimes we're all eager to move something and have our name recorded as the mover. Uh, but I, what I've found through the years has been respectful is the council liaison to that is the first person to move, or someone that's been directly involved with that project is the first to move. And sometimes it's, you know, res respect uh, whether it's, uh, you know, I expect that Councillor Madoff will be move, move it. But she'll say, I know you've been involved with it, and if you have a passion for it, why don't you move? You know, it's, it's sort of that kind of respect for each other uh, that I think you, you, it's a feeling that you get at the table. And in the years I've been at the table, media will look for that friction. You know, there's almost a time when a comment will be made, and you can turn to the media exactly knowing <laughs> that they're writing, you know, because that is what they're, they're looking for, is where there's conflict. I remember an a, a thing I had with um, Reverend Al, and we both agreed on something, but the media tried to divide one issue and try to get two stances. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Reverend Al, bless his heart, and we all love him, had this stance. And for me, I had to have the bigger overall picture for business, the tourism sector, everything. And they tried to, to divide us. And I remember meeting with Reverend Al, and, you know, we, we hugged and re recognized that and being able to speak in the same voice for what we're all trying to achieve. But while ch achieving the big picture, there may be some differing opinion and being respectful in that opinion. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, uh, I think there's a couple of good things. And I'm not really sure, um, on the resolution side, I mean, it's a council resolution. And sometimes people do get competitive around putting it forward. So it was Councillor A who did this. This is my initiative. Anything is decided, it's the council as a whole that does it. So I just wanted to say that. The other point was really around respect um, for the staff. And because they don't get a voice too much at this table, Gail's sitting at the table, but she hasn't said too much during this, and that's pretty typical. You're her boss, and um, that's what happens. It's really important, I think, that council not criticize <coughs> staff the city in a public setting. If you have concerns about city manager, the way that the city manager, any any staff member is doing their work, I think that's an appropriate thing that is dealt with in an in-camera setting with the city manager. And then, as I said earlier, I have opportunities to talk about that. Because the in all of these things, we're balancing your democratic right to say whatever you want, yes, you can, versus uh, protecting the city, the integrity, the reputation, the strength, the ability of the city to attract whatever it wants to attract to it. And the more professional and respectful you are as a group, doesn't mean don't disagree, doesn't mean do, don't do any of those things, but if you start to undermine your own entity, and to be honest, uh, you know, taking it in the provincial level, the way the provincial government has been undermining a lot of its own processes and exposing, I'm not saying it's wrong, but do those things, be on top of that, but you, you, the public confidence goes way down when you do that, and you need to think about the overall objective. So I'm sort of putting that in the context, picking up on the respect for staff comment. Okay, uh, uh, Chris, did you? No, Pam is next. Thank you. And then, uh, thank you. I'm yeah. appreciative of the amount of time that we've dedicated to this. I think it's really critical to the, the success of, of council. 
And just as a starting point, the notion of censoring the minority view on council is something that I, is an anathema to me. I think it's really important that there's an appropriate way for that, that view to be articulated. What it does is it puts um, a lot of responsibility on the individual members of council in terms of what their motivation is and that they are motivated uh, you know, from, a, from, a, from a position of integrity and not personalizing it and speaking really to, um, I mean, I think the language that was used that, that you would still be reflecting of the will of council, I think perhaps for me a more accurate word would be articulating the view of council. And moving on from that, I found it useful if uh, in taking a contrary view that you simply stick to the principles that you brought to that decision. And so you're not really seen as criticizing the other folks position, you're saying, this is the lens that I put to it, and this is, and this is why I was you know, unfortunately or fortunately not able to, um, uh, to support it. But I do think it's, um, it's important that we have that, that leeway and that we all understand what the, the, the nature of the engagement is. Um, I've seen the best and the worst of it over the years, and it can, it can be very, very destructive if it's used in the wrong way. But I think what is worse from, uh, from the public's point of view is the notion that those who've had a contrary view are just zipped up and they're done. So I think it's really important that we have this discussion and determine what those sort of rules of engagement are collectively, that we all at least understand what they are and what our expectations are of each other. And I guess that, I mean, that happens in the, because your meetings are open, I assume that, that the public can absolutely see. All six of them have come until we start to webcast. That's what. Uh, Chris. I, thank you, and I think good, good guidance um, from both Pam and, and Mary Ann. Just a comment on the democracy aspect, and we have to remember that, yes, we live in a society where we have democratic rights, and we would wish that they would exercise them more. It's actually a parliamentary democracy that we live in, so nine of us are elected to make decisions on behalf of certain aspects of municipal governance within Victoria. And the, the proof of that was actually visited on this last Thursday night when some people came and said, we don't want this path. And, there's a, and we said, I think fairly clearly, um, <coughs> we've passed that decision point. Now it's a question of how and when we do it properly. So I, I think we, we've always got to keep that in mind. There may be some people around the table who don't want to go with the path, and that's, they have an absolute right to articulate that. But I think council was fairly clear that we've passed that decision point. So it's always useful to keep that in mind. And then say, there may need to be more discussion <coughs> in, on the implementation side. That's absolutely fair, and, and people have different perspectives. And I agree with Pam. I don't think we want to ever be seen to constrain um, the offside voice, because I don't think that's helpful in any way. But I just. Remember that we, we choose to live in a parliamentary democracy, and that has some profound impacts. Uh, so two things. I, I like the addition of that not only do we explain the context of our reservations for a decision, but what Pam said, that we explain also the principles that we brought to the table when we disagreed with the majority decision. And then over to something that Charlene said uh, that relates <coughs> to respect. I think one thing, in, this is a pre-decision, not post-decision, but recognizing both that when we're talking about something, you know, for I'll use a concrete example because I find that helpful. I've been talking a lot in the media about the idea of participatory budgeting. I am very clear to say, A, this is not the will of council. This is me putting forward an idea. And so that's respectful, I think, of the, the process around the table. Council may say, hey, Lisa, that's terrible. We'll never do it. That's fine. Um, and then B, I'm also clear when I talk about the idea of participatory budgeting that there are limited staff resources and this is, you know, we'll have to make some decisions. If we do participatory budgeting, we don't do other things because, again, staff has a lot of work to do so that there's respect going that way too. And I think that that's really, it, it's, it's kind of a public form of respect because we're all in the media a lot, right? And so to be aware when we're in the media that we're being respectful towards the process and our colleagues and, and our staff colleagues as well. Okay, so this is respect not only for people, but it's also that there's a process. And the other point I'm picking up from what you're saying, which I think is important, is that discussing issues within the context of the big picture. Is, uh, because what I'm, you know, yeah, and, and the capacity. capacity. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I, exactly. 
<coughs> in particular the capacity of staff because if we you know decide to go on a participatory budgeting route that may or may not mean more work for them depending on how we would do it and so I when I'm talking about it publicly I recognize that uh, you know out of respect for staff capacity of staff Other comments around uh, is that Dean, you put the this issue forward around there's a decision, there's a majority, there's a minority. Um, are there other areas that any of you who anybody, but particularly those who have served and have lived through things, particularly sticky or troublesome areas that you would like to put on the table for any further thoughts? Phil? Um, when new um, initiatives come forward that haven't been part of the strategic planning process, you know, the, the rigor around that needs to occur because I think said by Lisa, you know, once you've decided on your priorities, something has to come off the sheet if we're going to put something mm -hmm. else on. I guess unless we devoted new resources. Or new yeah, that's right. And, and what we did last time with the new people, and to remind us for us, and I always say we did a really good job for, for two and a quarter years, and then the election comes and everything gets thrown out the window. But and we sat down as a, and, and said, these are our priorities. We negotiated and we did all those things like, here's your 47 red buttons, while well, I want this, so I'll put all 47 on one versus, I mean, we, we and then we, we came up with now, next, and then we, council sort of called it never. Um, staff called it, you know, later. <laughs> but, you know, once you had that by majority agreement of what were the top seven, it was the realization was um, if you wanted, if yours was in the next, that you had to finish something in the now to get that capacity stuff. Um, and, and what really helped us, I think, make a decision process, and I'd love to have this discussion, is, is we always said, thank you very much for this, this is a really good idea. It goes into the parking lot in every quarter or every. Uh, six months, we're back into that strategic planning saying, you know, come in. Because it's the way where you can circumvent the whole strategic planning process of saying, but look, this is a good idea. I want to do a community garden, you know. Well, you know, that was never in there, and yet that can pull council staff time, everybody off on it. So I think we did a good job as a council, as discipline, agreeing that we put it off to that uh, uh, position where everybody can bring all their new initiatives and stuff, and we can talk and put in context as opposed to the one-off. So I, mean, I think that's something I'd like to discuss further as we start to go into that priority business section, is that agreement. Now, election comes along and then everybody's you know, throwing up every idea that they have for, you know, because that's it's election time. But uh, it was a, a good process of actually saying, here's our priorities and making decisions. So that's part of what, and Lisa's thing is right there, because nothing, it isn't like we have the 1,500 people standing around in the lobby just waiting to do something. Um, direct capacity and so we need to figure out what's new, what's old, yeah. those are some issues. I think there's a job or at least a review of how new initiatives do come forward in a way that is um, responsive, you know, that is rigorous was the word I heard, um, process, I heard uh, there's some quarterly meetings. I think it's around um, order, the, an orderly way of bringing forward things. So it's not, um, don't bring things forward, nothing, nothing like that, but it is how do you bring them forward in a way that is the, an effective use of time, is considered early enough so that it can be determined whether it is within the strategy, whether it is within the financial and human resources that we have available to do all the things that we're doing. Is it something that will require something off the table? Because the, the system that you have permits you to bring issues forward, so you can do that. You, nobody would want to fetter your right to do that, but you need to recognize that if you do that in a way that's not efficient and not effective, you will spend a lot of time spinning your wheels and frustrating probably your staff and possibly other counselors 
the boss will be the public. But really, if you just think about the effectiveness of your staff trying to carry out things. So it may be, this is something that I did get during the interviews, was uh, a question around how this can, does, should come forward in a way. And it may be that there are good processes in place, we don't know about them, or it's written down somewhere, we just haven't seen it, I haven't seen it, or you don't know, or the new people don't know, or whatever. Or it may be, you know what, no, we need to actually sit this down, articulate it, bring it back in a process governance discussion, and kick it around. And we'll work with it, see how it works, and we'll review it. Um, okay, Shelley, one comment no, for you, fine. and then you're okay, you're good. What is in camera and openness? going to be discussed? Well, I think that you're going to, my, sen my sense is you're going to take all of these, there's a bunch of issues, and you'll see the last few slides are really around a number of issues that I identified as I was talking with people as areas that you may or may not um, have kinds of guidelines around that you may want to do that. So we're just a bit late if I could indulge you for five or ten minutes. Just wanted to flip through those and then have you decide maybe as a group um, what do you think you should do about everything we've talked about today and is there something that you want to do on a governance sense? Yeah, Dean? The only thing I want to add is there has been a lot of work done on a lot of stuff yeah. uh, and I don't think that I mean, even as a counselor or a mayor we can't remember everything that's been done and so perhaps if we start from a base of that it's almost like what it, we almost need to get to a point where you need to know what exists now yeah. before we start throwing out Absolutely. options and solutions. Absolutely. And that's the first step is is, yeah. is is knowledge. Look for light before they bring the heat. Yeah. So I, I just said, I put this as really as a question mark. Are there opportunities to improve our governance practices um, here as council? And these were issues that came up during the interviews, okay? Um, that some people felt, and I've just thrown everything into one list. Some people felt it would be helpful to have some written guidelines around roles and responsibilities that had a, be a bit more flavor to them. A code of conduct or declaration of values and principles, which quite a few of the things we've listed on expectations would fall within that kind of category, those public things. The meetings, you have a lot of uh, rules around the meetings, uh, so that one, you know, again, you've probably got quite a bit there. The policy development was a bit around this initiative issue. How does one bring forward things? We have technical documents that tell us how things are brought forward. In some ways, it's not that efficient or effective. And could we make it, could we put more flavor onto that? The meetings, this was really a few things. One is, um, uh, you know, how do things get onto the agenda? And some of that is clarification because you have a process to do that. Some of it is around this policy and initiative development. Um, we want to make sure that how we bring those things forward are productive and effective. Uh, there was some discussion around the pre-reading information and a suggestion that um, when we get reports on issues, it may be helpful if there was a bit of a summary template at the front of it that talked about the issue, the relevance to our strategic initiatives, the impact on the long-term financial plan, uh, the risks associated with it, the recommendations, a bit more. And you could articulate what you think, but it would allow you to have something that was streamlined. The other comment, uh, one of the other comments was for the presentations that we get, let's not just repeat the 80 pages that I just read over the weekend. And so it would be better, could we have the presentations that really focus us in on um, the key issues that we need to decide, the, the, the areas of concern that we really want to make sure we understand and debate, and could we do that? Some people were also concerned that, well, if we don't say, nobody says anything in the public meeting, then the public will think, you know, we just made this decision out of the blue, um, but it really is tied with this issue of length of meetings, making efficient use of meeting time. Some counselors would say, look, I, I've read the 300 page package, uh, I come here and I'm ready to talk, and I wanna talk. And now I'm being spoon fed all the stuff I just read, 
and now I'm bored and I really wish I was somewhere else and I don't feel very energized to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. So it's really around looking at the meeting practices and how can we make it the most engaging. Some concern around last minute addition. So what are our guidelines around, you know, things that, how, how much ahead of time do we want to see them and uh, uh, I'm not very happy to get last minute additions. Everyone knows occasionally there's an emergency but it shouldn't be a practice. A lot of people talked about the need and want to focus the discussion at a higher level. The policies, the systems, the long term, the future, and to delegate the deal details and the operations to our staff. And so um, when you're thinking about and if you do develop some sort of guidelines in terms of approach, thinking about the language uh, to keep us focused on the high level. But the big things, the big nuts. Let's put our our uh, our heads together on the on the big issues. And we talked about this. People uh, were certainly desirous. I would say the ma large large majority of the people that I spoke to was to say that we should have a positive, respectful culture. We may not agree, but we should have a positive, respectful culture among counselors, between council and staff. Um, and taking into consideration the role of the mayor, and I, that was my note really to myself to say the role of the mayor in sort of maintaining the culture, the, the process of meetings, and we talked about that earlier about how the mayor is expected to take a certain role of speaking order or length of time or what have you, and that this should be understood in the context of the culture. Um, there were some questions about the committee structure and is it an appropriate time to look at the effectiveness of those committees? And as I said earlier today that um, I think that good organizations review their governance structure from time to time and you always want to question the sort of efficiency of the processes you use so that maybe something that you would look at is the effectiveness of the different committees that you have. Um, the concept of regular evaluation, people like the idea of reflecting on how we do our work together and are we functioning well, and setting the right kind of delineation between governing and managing, which is a lot of what we talked about today. Um, people, you know, the in-camera uh, sessions that I talked about, um, there's obviously substantive issues which are very um, legally driven about what you can and can't do. Um, but there's opportunities to think about the process and the use of in-camera meetings, dealing with process-oriented things and functioning, uh, council relations, council staff relations, those kinds of things. And that those are issues that can be dealt with there. Financial literacy we've talked about, that many expressed a desire that it would be helpful to have more support in that area, coupled with that, that concept around the ongoing orientation. And some people, uh, as a question mark, uh, some people talked about, yeah, it might be useful to have some kind of working group. Shelley earlier said, well, does it have to be just a small group? And it certainly doesn't you can do whatever you want. Sometimes it's just more efficient to, you know, pull together what we do have and to, to lay it out for everybody. Um, last page of this is uh, a few of the governance processes specifically that are not necessarily formally in place or known um, or carried out at a council level in a formal way and there may be opportunities to formalize that. Um, this issue that we talked a lot about this morning of the citizen complaints, inquiries, what's the process, how does it work, how do we monitor at a systemic level, there was definitely a a desire, I would say, by that would that would be a uh, an issue a lot of people thought would be useful. Transparency, so um, governance policies on the website, more information for the public about your responsibilities that are are in more of a lay language, so that people can understand um, and also how the governance works and the things that we've been talking about today. So. A lot of things that came up during the interviews, I think we, we talked a lot about. The last one here, we actually started, and Dean, you were out of the, uh, out of the room, and I just wanted to make sure you were here. A um, couple of questions around how appointments get made. 
um, and the importance of, uh, you know, we talked here on the expectation somewhere around merit and process and understanding how those are made um, is important to clarify. So these are the kinds of things that, again, that's an area where one would typically see this is how they're normally done, this is the approach, this is the timeline, you know, this is what the mayor does, this is what the council does, uh, blah, blah, blah. So whatever it is, you can all decide the substance of it, but that was an area that people thought were important. So it was um, a lot of things, as I say, a lot of them we've talked about, and the questions here are really what we've also been talking about today is that, uh, do you think there's opportunities to improve our governance, and if so, what are they, and what are the priorities? Um, as I said, it was never the intention today to say, okay, well, you know, we've got to do X, Y, and Z, um, and, and this is the substance of what that policy should say. I think that the intention was to say, here's some thoughts around good governance, here's some feedback, here's some areas that are kind of challenging. My own observation is that you do have opportunities to articulate more plainly in writing some of these areas, and the question back to you is, is that something that you think is worthwhile, and if so, what would be a next step? What would be your kind of takeaway from today? Anyone want to jump in? Any thoughts? You think you should, Marianne? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I really appreciate your consultations for me. I think it helped us get to some really interesting discussions. But it's just the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think some of some of the answer to your question you start having is that you to the based on counselors' answers to some surveys as well. But for me, it always comes down to having some kind of a tool to continue, make sure that the conversation continues. <coughs> and so I would very much like to consider having some kind of a working group set up, and whether that's the whole council or part of the council, I'm not really concerned about that. Uh, from the level of getting the work done, mm -hmm. uh, I think the staff have to be involved uh, significantly, and so that's obviously a factor in managing what that tool looks like. Um, but I would like to be able to leave today saying, you know, great job starting, lots of fabulous ideas, many of which I saw consensus on, but which now need to be taken to the level of operational capacity. Okay, how do you make that happen? If we're going to do this, you know, what's, what's the process that we need to engage in in order to make sure that it is done, as you said many times today, in the context of a larger overview so that we're not one-offing stuff and inadvertently doing things which maybe six months or a year from now will come back and be in conflict with something else. Uh, but that has utility and practicality, but ensures us that we are going to move towards this direction. I didn't hear anybody this morning say that they were against a, some kind of an analysis of our governance processes. You know, I think some of it's working really well, some of it's not, and that's a really important thing to acknowledge, that there's good and not so good. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to suggest that one of the things that we have on the table is for us to go away and think a bit more individually about everything that we've said today, with the idea that in a period of time, I don't know, a few weeks, maybe a month, that we could uh, look at setting up some kind of a working group. And also, that many of these issues will come forward, I think, continually as we go through the priority setting sessions. And they should. And for me, the, the biggest question is, should, should governance be a priority in this term? And I think a review of governance should be a priority in every term. And the question is just to what extent is it necessary? In some terms, for some councils, it may be very brief. You know, there, there may be a high level of satisfaction with how things are working. In other terms, it may be very extensive. And so the question for me is not whether, it's just the extent to which it happens and how, and how to make that happen. So I'd, I'd like us to leave today saying, yes, it should be a priority, and let's look to our next meetings to determine how big a priority and what that, what that actually means on a practical level. Well, I've got the suggestion of a working group uh, articulate the issues to be addressed. So get a sense of, you know, what are all the things that we talked about today? Let's put them in a list. Um, and then have the discussion, what are those things? Where does this fit on the priority list? And then if we do go, I don't know if the working group 
does that first or whether we have that discussion as a group first and then and then you'll decide if you put together a working group to do something on it depending on what priority you think it requires during the term. Lisa and then Rob? Yeah, I had written down something similar to what Marianne said. It may be that one of our priorities for the next three years will be governance and I think, you know, the certain members of the public might say, oh, well, that's navel-gazing and can't you really do something in the city? But I think what good governance allows us to do, and you said this when we had our interview and again today, it allows us to be purposeful and proactive. And so I would, I would echo that it could possibly be one of our priorities for the next three years, how we go about implementing it. Uh, and I think that the working group and the formation of that should happen after we have a discussion of what the priorities are. I think it would be premature to start a working group tomorrow unless we know if this is something collectively that we think is a good idea for the next three years. And, and just for counsel, I wanted to make sure you understood that we sort of engage Liz to uh, have the discussion about the bigger ticket items related to what's your governance outlook, your policies, your principles, and how those apply to your practices. We will uh, be involved, our office, the rest of the administration, in the mechanical elements of governance. So what committees do you have? Mm -hmm. How do we staff them? You know, those types of things. So we're doing both and we're starting both discussions today uh, but there is an element of handover and the mechanical stuff is very much you know owned by us collectively the administration and, and the council and then I just think lots of good ideas prompted by the discussion today in terms of what are the things you take for granted that we could usually that really benefit us and I've, I've seen a host of issues yeah, um, I like the idea of a working group. Um, I think I think very task oriented, different than a standing committee. Maybe it would evolve into that. But so when I can I borrow this? Sure. When I received this, like obviously could, the administration's put a huge amount of work into very specific proposals, and the first thing that came to mind upon reading it is that I would like to refer this to a working group of council and maybe designating three people who have to be there, but allowing it to be a committee of the whole <laughs> if everyone wanted to weigh in. But as a first order of business to give the administration these proposals the consideration that they deserve, but looking at them from our public office holders' hats. So I was going to recommend that uh, whether we do that as a committee of a whole this afternoon, I don't know if that's the most efficient use of time. So I kind of wanted to refer this to a body that didn't yes, yet exist. And I was thinking even just with that single task, to report back on this document and what we'd like to implement, but whether it could look on a more ongoing basis at governance. So it sounds like this afternoon you're going to be having a conversation around some specific ideas that have been put forward, and maybe during that conversation you would then go a little bit deeper on next steps and articulate the plan that, that uh, administration and council think is the best way to tackle this and uh, move it forward. Okay. Any, any last thoughts as we kind of wrap up this portion of thought stimulation and discussion around governance and where you might go with it? I just want to thank you, Liz, for doing the work that you've done. And, and all. Obviously, we, the last four slides are interesting of issues that we need to walk through. And as Marianne articulated, this is the beginning of the, yeah. beginning of the start. Um, thanks, Council. Good, good discussion. Uh, my, my hope is that uh, we will we have lunch, that we'll mm. go grab food, come back. And with your indulgence, we'll move into the in-camera stuff. I, we can eat while Tom talks, uh, and then uh, we can move back out and deal with um, uh, the next piece, the Council Governance Model Review with Mr. Woodland. Uh, I will say in that larger sense, part of the initial discussion is it's easier to reflect the will of Council when you have all of Council kicking in. Um, and so sometimes it's like, hear it, set some parameters, then set the working group out if that's the way you choose. Then they have an understanding of where their, their, their colleagues want to go. Very much as we try to do in our governance procedure where, you know, you may have three people sitting on a specific committee, whether it be planning or finance, but part of them is to understand where the interest of their other counselors know and know when to bring things up and when they need to kick it. And, and that only happens through hanging out, talking as the issues come that you could better understand. Thank you for participating. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Okay. Thanks, Liz. Uh, motion for recess then. So we could move. Uh, are we committee the whole or council? Uh, you are uh, the whole. Thank you. So I don't need a second or a All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Recess or?
And then come on back here, guys. Yeah. Yeah. So just 15 minutes for a break.